to call the order of the Wednesday meeting for June State Board of Education. I'd like to mention that all members are here except for Michelle Dombrowski. So welcome to the meeting. Uh, we look forward to our day's agenda. And speaking of the agenda, uh, you should have a copy on your computer and I would look for approval of the agenda for today. Janet Wall, second. Ben Jones, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, looks like a 9-0 to me. Okay, well, we are excited today to hear from Rod Garman at Keisha, and he's going to talk to us a little bit. He works with the student council group, among many other responsibilities. So welcome, Rod. We're glad to have you here today. So thank you. How are you all doing today? Good, good. Well, I am no problems. I'm problem free. I just got back last night from Jamaica on family vacation. So yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, and but when I got this invitation from Peggy to um, have this opportunity, I was like, definitely, I will be up and ready to go for that. And I'm so glad to be here with all of you today. As um, Kathy mentioned, my name is Rod Garman. I know many of you from years past and, and other realms. I've been in education for years, but I am just now completing my first year at the Kansas State High School Activities Association. I do oversee most of the S's. I oversee soccer, swimming and diving, STUCO, which is what I'll be here to talk about today, and Scholars Bowl, so the full gamut. I love it. It's been a great experience. So. Um, I guess what I'm going to start off with today, of course, is just mention not only is there student council, which is one of our leadership organizations we get to oversee, but we also have K, which I'm sure you're familiar with as well, which is another great leadership and service opportunity um, that we have throughout our state. And then, of course, our student advisory team that is made up of um, 12 students from across the state, six juniors in high school, six seniors, and we do have representation from um, all locales. And I would love to somehow connect with the State Board of Education and have you guys be a part of that sometime, either in our fall meeting or our spring meeting. I think that would be a great platform uh, that maybe we could get some interaction and dialogue with actual students out there in the field. And um, so if you're ever interested in that, please feel free to reach out and contact me and, and we can make sure and get that arranged. Um, but what I am here to talk about today is student council. And um, I'm very excited. You have some information at your um, seats about our leadership workshop taking place this summer at Emporia State Uni University. It's July 21st through 26th, and it is our 56th annual leadership workshop. So it's actually been around longer than some of us in the room. So um, last year was my first opportunity to be a part of that, and um, I was so fortunate that I actually got to be in on the ground floor last year, and I got to experience, experience it from a council perspective. What we do is we have over 350 students from across the state that attend, plus we have anywhere between 30 to 40 advisors who come as well that are student council advisors at various high schools or middle schools. And um, we have 40 staff on board, so we have quite a, quite a contingency at Emporia State University. But what we do throughout the week is we divide all of our participants into councils of 20 to 24 students. And those councils are led by a senior counselor and a junior counselor who are part of our staff. Junior counselors are recently graduated seniors from high school who've participated in the workshop before and who were in student council at their, their various schools. Um, and they work along with a senior counselor member um, who's, a, who's a staff member at schools, who's a STUCO advisor, et cetera. We have, oh gosh, we have over 250 years of experience on our staff involving with student council. So definitely I'm not the one doing the whole show um, at this workshop. I have a great team um, who helped me out with it. But throughout the week in their councils, what they do is they create a school. They, just, they determine the demographics of that school. Um, they determine the name of that school, the mascot, et cetera. But then more importantly, they get into what are our strengths at our school? What are our issues or our concerns? And then throughout the week, they're developing how would we address these issues or these concerns? How would we come together to make our school even better? And how can we impact our community even better? 
Um, and I, as I said, I got to experience that last year at the ground level as a senior counselor. Um, I was just thrown in and I loved it. And, and most importantly for me, oh, I should have probably hit play on this. In the background, it's just going to be a slideshow playing for you um, just throughout the whole week because it is a, a five night, six day event and there's so much going on. So you can kind of see those as, I, as I'm talking. Um, probably much better to be looking there than to be looking at me. Um, but anyway, uh, I got to experience that last year at the ground level and the impact it had on my council L, we were council L, um, to see how those kids had come together throughout the week, the friendships they developed, the teamwork, to see them all, I, I am not a purple, I'm gonna talk about silent colors here in just a moment, but a purple is someone who wears their emotions and, and can cry easily and things like that. And I kept being told, oh, wait till that last council meeting. You're going to be just, you better have your Kleenex. And I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, but by that last council meeting, we had gotten so close as a council. And um, those kids just, wow, I did need Kleenex at that point. Um, and so it was really good for me to see that at the ground level and, and how it impacted kids and how they would take back what they learned to their schools. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. Um, this year, I'm very excited. If you were to go to our website, Keisha.org, and go under non-athletic to student council, you would see a bunch of information there, included highlighting our two keynote speakers this year at our workshop. One is Ted Weesey. He has been at our, our workshop before. He is a leadership a motivational speaker. He's amazing, and the kids always rate him very high. Thus, that's why I'm having him back this year. Um, but our other one I'm very excited about this year is Kim Carr. She is all about using social media for good, for positive. Um, she's out of California. She helped start, co-founded the I Can Help um, movement, or I Can Help Delete Negativity, if you want to ever look that up. Um, but she, what her whole focus is, is to get kids to be able to use their devices to be in control of their devices rather than devices controlling them and using it for good, for positive. Um, and I know we, we all know there's lots of online bullying and different things going on through social media, et cetera. Um, I, I got to see her um, this past December in, in um, Atlanta when I was at a conference and I saw her and I'm like, I have got to get her with our Kansas kids because she has not been involved in Kansas yet. And I can't wait for her to have that first introduction to our Kansas kids and, and to see the impact she has on them. Um, so that's something new I'm bringing in this year is, is to uh, talk about how we can use those social media devices and, and platforms to, to help better um, our surroundings. Um, we obviously have a curriculum for leadership. And um, throughout the week, we have daily themes. We start with goal setting. Um, of course, we always got to start with what our goals are, right? and then go into organization and planning. Um, then we get into understanding our different leadership or our different personality styles, and we do what's called the silent colors. Um, you may be familiar with those. Um, but it helps you just take an introspective look at yourself as to what are my strengths? What are my um, weaknesses as a leader? How do I best function or operate within a group? Am I more of a quiet leader? Am I more of an out front, outspoken type leader? Um, and then more importantly, how do I work with others of these types? Um, and so that was very impactful for me to see last year and how that uh, impacted people. And then once we do our silent colors, personality inventory and surveying things and determine what our colors are, of course they're wearing their color bands all week. So you know if you're talking with an orange, a purple, a green, or a silver. Um, and how do I best get the most out of them? Um, because it is all about collaboration. It's huge in our workshop during the week and um, collaborating with others and listening to others' um, perspectives. Then we get into attitude and communication. Now that we know how all these different people function, how do we communicate best? How do we work together to accomplish our goals? Because we are, we have created this imaginary school, right, with these issues and, and we want to be able to solve them. How can we as a, as a council of 20 to 24 most impact um, uh, our school because basically what we're doing is we are role modeling throughout the entire week what they need to go back and do as student leaders in their schools and what they can do with their student councils in their schools um, so they can just take back what they've learned and, and put it into action and that is our final day is uh, take action 
And um, our theme this year, leadership, it starts with us. We want to just keep bringing that home about, you know, you can make an impact. You can affect your school in a positive way and your community. Um, we also um, do character education throughout the week. We um, use a video series um, developed by Mark Sharonbrock. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that series, um, but it talks about making memories, being respectful, moves on into staying motivated, and learning to lead. <clears throat> Other skills, I think, that come out throughout the week as these kids are working together in their councils, of course, they're problem solving, right? Um, compromising. Doesn't always go your way, right? You got to sometimes give a little to get what you want. And, and how do you make that work? There's lots of laughing taking place, lots of connecting. Um, and as I mentioned before, there is some crying at the end when we all have to depart and go our separate ways again. Um, but some activities throughout the week, it is just jam packed throughout the week. And, and throughout these pictures, you've probably seen some kids in some funny hats, right? Those are our junior counselors. Um, and it starts right from day one. Those kids are being dr drove up by their sponsors or whoever's bringing them parents are being dropped off right there at the dorm. And those junior counselors are out there just going crazy, inviting them, welcoming them. Um, the energy is amazing and it keeps up throughout the entire week. Um, but some other events that take place, we have the Indoor Olympics, which takes place early in the workshop. And that's where councils are doing these um, activities, these games in the rec center. Um, right off day, it's like night one, well, night two. And, and that's an interesting experiment just to watch that in itself. How do they best operate? That's once again, they're still getting to know each other. They don't really know their leadership styles yet. And, and it's fun to watch who takes the lead and who kind of stands back and how they best operate together as a team. Um, there's officer training that we, uh, we uh, t uh, present throughout the week, and we have our different books for all the different officers, whether they're president, down through a representative. They go to separate trainings on, on how to most effectively impact their student councils back at home. Um, the silent color activity I mentioned. Um, our advanced council, we do have some kids who come back a second year, in which they may. And those councils actually work um, locally there in the community with um, Special Olympics. They go out and they bowl with them um, one afternoon and, and do some interaction within the community to provide some community service. Um, we have what's called the Sunflower Derby that comes up in the middle of the week. And I thought this was pretty cruel when I first experiment, experienced it. But then I saw what it did and I was, oh, OK, now I get it. We actually set them up to fail a little bit in that Sunflower Derby. They're going around the campus trying to accomplish these tasks throughout and how to best attack and which tasks to do first. And, and there's a lot of frustration going on throughout that activity. There's lots of, ah, we can't get it right. And um, it's fun to see how they deal with that, with failure, and, and how, to, how to come back and, and adjust. And it's OK sometimes if we don't accomplish all our goals. Um, and then we have, of course, we want to model a great dance opportunity because, of course, they all put on dances at their high school, right? So we have a, a great DJ that comes in. And, and what I love about it, not only do we have the dance going on, because dancing's not for all, right? We have an open mic going on next door, kind of like a coffee house setting, um, which is kind of cool. So that's sometimes the first time some kids see that happening, and they take that back to their schools. Um, throughout the week, our junior counselors are presenting gifts um, to the entire delegation. And that's a personal gift of some attribute of themselves that they'd like to give. And that's kind of a demonstration because at the end, each council, after our banquet Thursday night, we do gift presentations as councils as to what do we want to give um, to the rest, everyone else that's there. Um, and so that's, that's a very powerful moment on Thursday night. So as you can see, there's so much going on. But I think at the end also, uh, one of the last days, most impactful to me was a time for reflection. And we pass out this book called A Place to Stand. And this is kind of just like a, a diary of sorts for them to have for, for them to use however they want. But there's all kinds of tidbits of leadership information in here. There's places for them to journal. Um, and I was amazed because uh, we basically give them 45 minutes to an hour then after we, we talk about reflection and, and what it's meant all week to just sit and just to kind of start collecting their thoughts. You could have heard a pen drop in that room. It was unbelievable. Over 400 people in this large room, just quiet, and they were all just so 
in depth into what they were doing. Um, so that was a powerful tool as well, because we want to learn to reflect as well. So I've thrown out a lot of key words that I think tie right into what you're doing, right, with, with education here in our state. Um, and we would like to help uh, work together and help strengthen uh, your goals and initiatives as well, and hopefully we're doing that. Um, I'd like to invite any of you, anytime, to come out that week of July 21st through 26th. You could come to anything, but some things I would point out um, that might be good times. Well, shoot, I could even put you on the spot and get you involved in a QA and a if you wanted to, uh, but that would be on Wednesday um, at 11 o'clock. I'm bringing in some former um, delegates, some former junior counselors that will uh, be open to questions and answers from these students as they're getting ready to embark to life after high school, after um, what, what are they doing next. Um, but that'd be a great time for you to be there. On Wednesday, July 24th, it'd be from <laughs> 11 to 11.50. Also coming Thursday night, the 25th at 6 o'clock, we have a formal banquet, as I mentioned, and then we have their gift presentations that take place, and also a powerful uh, candy, candle lighting ceremony after that that follows. So that would be another good time to come out to workshop. But if you want to come see any of it, you want to come to the Indoor Olympics, you want to come to the Sunflower Derby, the dance, whatever you may want to attend, just let me know. I'd be glad to um, have you there and to host you while you're there. Um, some other opportunities leadership-wise that are taking place in our state, along with this leadership workshop. Um, of course, we put on regional conferences in the fall. We do eight of them around the state. I was just mentioning to Jean over here that we'll be out in Garden City. Um, but uh, that's a great uh, opportunity also if, if you happen to see on our website when our regional conferences are near you. If you want to come out and attend that, it's a morning only. Um, I have a keynote that travels around the state with me. We then break into advisors and students and, and do some leadership workshops as well. Um, and then also this summer, I have, for the first time, we have a delegation of Kansas uh, students and advisors attending the Vision Conference, the Region 6 Vision Conference being held in Hot Springs, Arkansas this year. I thought we better get on board with this because I think we're hosting it now, and I do know now we're hosting it in 2021. So I need to get out there and see what this is all about. But this came about because there is a national conference put on, of course, by the National Federation of High Schools. And our region, which includes New Mexico, Arizona, Oklahoma, Colorado, Missouri, Arkansas, and us, I guess a few years ago, this is the third vision conference, decided we wanted to offer an alternative to that that's um, less expensive, more feasible to attend, um, and it's more student focused actually. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, like I said, we have over 20 delegates going from Kansas for the first time, um, and hopefully that'll be a good experience. Plus for the first time ever, we have some students from Kansas attending the National Federation of High Schools Leadership Summit being held um, in Indianapolis. Unfortunately, that always falls on our student council workshop week. That's why we've not had anyone go in the past. But um, if you're familiar with Lawrence Free State, they have a um, student athletic leadership team, SALT. Um, and Amanda Fonts is their uh, sponsor there. She's an assistant principal. She's taking a few students um, to that. So I'm excited that we'll be represented at the NFHS Leadership Summit as well. Um, I've, sh I've taken some time to share some information with you. I want to make sure I leave some time for some questions um, that I can answer directly any questions that you may have. Thank you, Rod. It's uh, good to hear a lot of the great things that are going on at Keisha. And I know, I think it was about a year ago, we heard from um, Cheryl about the KAY group. And so that was helpful. Uh, and I do think that the board is very interested in having some interaction and getting some feedback from students about some of our initiatives. So we had quite a conversation, interestingly enough, about vaping yesterday. And that might be an interesting topic to have a conversation and get some impact or feedback from the students sure. about va vaping because we're looking at some uh, recommendations we're going to be uh, sending out to schools about that particular topic. Uh, so that'd be very timely. I think maybe what I'm going to ask is our two uh, state board reps, uh, Dina and Jim McNeese, to get with you and to come up with some ideas of when either all the board members or some of the board members could interact uh, in some different times and just get feedback. Uh, I think we'd, you know, annually a time or two would maybe like to do some of that so I'll probably I haven't even asked them I just thought I'd do that but there are two Keisha reps and ask them to get with you when they can and report back to the board with some ideas of of when we could do some uh, 
oh, not necessarily formal, but kind of informal interactions. And again, it maybe wouldn't be all of the board, but some of the board uh, to get together and uh, be able to hear those student voices. I mean, here we don't, we do sometimes, but mostly it's indirect. And that would be an opportunity for some direct. So host, Dina and Jim, I hope that's okay. I just volunteered yeah. you. So <laughs> I'll be seeing Dina later this afternoon yep, yep. at executive board. So. That's that's what you were that's what you were gonna Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, any other uh, Board questions or comments that you'd like to ask, Rod? Uh, we really appreciate your time today. I know you've got a board meeting to go to, sure. so we appreciate you visiting with us today and sharing the great things that are going on for students. And well, you know, we uh, have amazing kids. In absolutely, and that just shows throughout. And um, I would love to be able to connect those kids with you mm -hmm. and and be able to have some dialogue. So that would be great. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I think the board would be very interested in that and. Uh, It'd be a great opportunity. I mean, we could talk to Cheryl's group too, uh, the KAY group, and I think there's probably some other student organizations. So I'll let you guys kind of, you know, figure that out and see what you think might be some good opportunities uh, because we're, we really are very interested in what, you know, the, by the time the kids are in high school, they've gone through most of their education and they'd have some good yeah. feedback for us. They have some great feedback, yeah. great perspectives, and that's what I love about them creating those schools that are workshop. Because it's amazing. Hmm. Those issues or concerns are actual ones they're dealing with back at their mm -hmm. own schools. They're not mm -hmm. just made up, right? Um, and so it's great to hear what's going on and how they want to address them and go back with a plan. So. And I, I, I'd also love to hear how that speaker, the one that's going to talk about how you positively use social yeah. media, man, I'd love to hear about that. What a great opportunity that is and to get our kids thinking a little differently about social media. If you go to our website, you can connect to Kim Carr. I have her website and, and her uh, Twitter. Yeah, that, that, that sounds pretty exciting. Any other questions? Jim? <clears throat> do we still, do you still host regional student council workshops? I do. Yes, we do. Um, and that we would be a way to, uh, for the board members to get involved by alerting them to the when they're go where they're going to be and when they're going to be. Yes, those, that schedule is also on our website. Like I said, there's eight of them across the state. They start that last week in September. We do Monday through Thursday, and then we come back the first week in October, well, it's September 30th through October 3rd, Monday through Thursday as well. Um, and You might forward your website them. links to sure. the board members. And just You can send it to Peggy, and she'll get it to us. Yep. She has it. She's good. Yep. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you very much, Rod. We do appreciate you being here today, and uh, especially since you just got back late last hey, night. And, and you know what? I wouldn't miss out on the opportunity. I appreciate the invite and would encourage you to come out anytime. So it was no, no, problem. no problem. No problem. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Have a great day. Okay. Okay. It looks like we've got Mr. Dale coming in, and we've got two topics, review, education, legislation, and begin. this is the beginning of our discussion on budget recommendations, and I know uh, Dale and Craig and Randy will probably have some interesting comments on that, so welcome, uh, Dale. Thank you. It's an honor to be with dignitaries. Uh, you too, Jim. Okay. Uh, it, I kind of look at this as kind of a family visit, and we'll just give you some background answer. You can ask any questions you want to ask, and uh, the other thing I want to mention that will help, I hope we'll have it by our next board meeting, uh, we get the, the governor's, what's called the governor's, or the budget divisions allocations, and it, it's kind of an indication what the administration has in mind for next year. We'll get that, they, they say the second week in July. So if we get it, it's going to be probably the day of board meeting or something like that. But it'd be helpful to know that before we finalize ours. So we're, we will encourage them to be sure that we get that so that we can provide that uh, to the board. Okay. Uh, let's go. I want to talk about these two things for three items. It's interesting history here. And some of it is we, we kind of, 
I don't recall ever happening before. Evidence-based reading program. Remember on the I station, we had 2.1 million. We contracted for it. Remember, Lexia had it for a couple of years. Legislature said, and that was done by the legislature, said you didn't bid it. So we want it bid. And it was done by the House Appropriations Committee, and, and they put it in. So we bid it. And uh, at the board chose I station, and they've had that program for the last, I think, this third year? I think the third year. And this year, they changed the law. And we uh, appealed the $2.1 million and we got, I don't know, 1.8 or 9 million, but when it, the time they got through, they cut it to 1.2 million. 1.2 million, and they changed the proviso. It's a proviso and appropriation bill. They changed it, and it says any evidence based reading program. Well, we have to uh, do approve that. So, Scott Smith will be coming to you next month with a list of evidence-based reading programs for your review. And any district that has an evidence-based reading program, and it only applies to pre-K through third grade. That's it, pre-K through third grade. Then what we have to do is determine the number of students that are enrolled and participating in that program next September 20th. And then we'll allocate the funds based on so much per student. And it'll probably be, I don't know, eight, nine dollars a student. Something like that is what they'll get. The effect and the, the money saving we did on bidding is gone. Because now it applies to there'll be a, a I don't know, eight or ten different reading programs probably out there that will be on the list. Scott's working on that now. And so they will report to us the number of students on next September 20th. We'll determine that number, and based on the amount of the appropriation, they'll get about 8 or $9 a kid. The law also says for every $3 in state aid they get, they've got to match it with $1. Another way, your total expenditures has got to be 25%. It's got to come from local. Or you can say one third of the state money. They got that won't be an issue. That'll be a pretty simple thing because uh, you you got to have staff involved and all this. So the matching amount is insignificant. Now, so um, you're going to take the same hundred and fifty thousand kids or so that were using I Station, and those kids in those schools will get this one point two million. Or, no, how, I mean, how did we come up with eight bucks? Isn't that that's eight? just an estimate on my part? And I did. I took the number of kids in pre-K through third grade and oh, divided okay. it into the number of dollars we got. See, I station is more than third grade. Uh -huh. They go into upper. This is pre-K through third grade. And that's one hundred and fifty thousand kids or so. Uh, it's so, potential. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank that's you. Potential. One hundred and fifty, fifty-five thousand in that range. That happens to coincide with about the number that's in the program now, but that's just by coincidence. Uh, and this, it, it eliminated the bidding. Local board chooses their, who are they, what program they want, and what we do is help fund it. That's the bottom line. The governor did not support that program. Not, she supported reading, but not that program on the grounds that it's such an insignificant amount of money. And if we're putting $200 million in general state aid, let local boards make that decision and we don't have to need that. So it wasn't in our budget. We appealed it to keep the I station money because it was in our budget. Uh, and th this is what we ended up with. And this was done by conference committee. Teach for America. Teach for America uh, was put in by somebody on the House side. Nobody seems to know exactly where it came from. I talked to staff about it. Remember last year they gave us about $520,000, and I think the latest word I had, 
and some of you, Randy may have something more up to date. I think we're getting three teachers to the, to the tune of $270,000. Uh, so the money that was left over more or less from last year is what that 261000 amounts to. It's not quite, but it's real close. And it's earmarked Teach for America. The governor vetoed that as well as she vetoed the million two. She vetoed that also. And what happened is they put, they lumped all of the vetoes, or not all, but five different vetoes. Remember the Cavers bill and then the tax bill? They lumped them all into one and they voted as a block and on her vetoes. And so, and they, they approved it. These three programs was not big players in all that. With me? The big players was Capers and the Capers bill was the big player. So, and they support that. These were minor, very minor in most of people's eyes. And they weren't even discussed much on the floor. So she, since she vetoed those, they override it. You could probably have a pretty think that she probably would not be supportive this year. You with me? When the allocations come down, she didn't put it in, and she vetoed it, <coughs> it probably won't be in our budget for 21. Will be for next year because he overread the veto. The Teach for America is there at the, the current time, and uh, our, uh, our folks will be, have to start working on that. They thought, our, our people in our agency, they thought when it was vetoed that it was dead, it was gone. And normally, a high, high percentage of the cases, that's true. But they lumped in with this other vetoes, and they approved it. Dale, am, am I the only one who, who's, I'm recalling six teachers for that 260 k instead of three? Does anybody else remember it being six teachers? I think... I think it's someplace between. I, I I thought it was more than three, but uh, I also, if I remember correctly, a couple of those that they chose would have been eligible in Kansas City for the specialized certificate and would have gotten there anyway without their help. Uh, Steve, now, I I, that I, I've funny. slept yeah. since I heard that, so Thank there's you. a possibility that that's not accurate, but that's the way I remember it. I, I think you, you're correct. I think when it came to the board, it was five, as I recall, five, but it turned out when it was all said and done, I think it's three, so it turned out to be. Uh, incentive for tech ed. That was not funded, and it was and, and vetoed. But what that boils down to is they put it back in and they overrode the veto. That $80,000 is to pay for the test for the career tech ed students, you know, the, the vocational certificates. Maybe it's for auto mechanics or it could be a, a lot of different uh, of computerized programs, so worth software program. And this dollar amount, what will happen next year is that uh, at the end of the year, school districts will send us the cost of what they spent for uh, the students uh, taking those tests, and we'll just send them a check. And I don't know this to be a fact, but I think the, the governor thought the school districts paying for it was appropriate, but $80,000 out of the two, we're going to get $200 million was not something the schools could do on their own. They didn't need our support, our support for that. I think she liked the program, but didn't think they needed the financial support. So those three things were overridden, overridden uh, on the veto, and uh, we've got them. So, and you'll you'll see next month the the reading programs that's being suggested that would qualify as evidence based. And teach oh, there's Teach for America right there. She just walked in. Uh, she thought we weren't going to have that issue, but we got it back. And then incentive for tech ed, that's just a matter of uh, at the end of the year, how much did you spend, and we'll reimburse you up to the amount of the 80000 I think that'll cover it. Dale, uh -huh. on the reading programs, 
so will the district itself be responsible for negotiating a price, or is it just going to yes. kind of be what the vendor wants yes. to charge them? That's right. The local board makes a decision, and they pay the bill, and what we pay will be considered will be less. They're going to put money in it. Mm -hmm. And the money they put in it will be more than 25% of the cost. That We'll check it for audit purposes, but it, it'll be it'll be a five-minute check. So, so the net, so that all of you understand this, because a lot of the districts that you serve will be using, are currently using iStation. That was funded entirely by the money allocated. Mm -hmm. And now if they want to continue to use that, I have no idea what iStation will do, but it's conceivable that the reimbursement, that the cost for them obviously is going to go up because they were paying zero. And the reimbursable may not cover that cost because the state contract drove costs down, whether it was Lexia before or I station after. Yeah. So you may hear that from some of your districts. Well, we were getting that for free and now it's X amount of dollars per pupil and the state only gave us X amount of dollars, didn't cover the cost. Yeah. Yes, that's probably going to be true. Yeah, we, we lost the effect of a statewide bid. And when you do it individually, it's going to cost more. Eight okay. Randy's on target. Jim, Jim Porter has a question. So if I understand correctly, we have a lot of kids, a lot of students that are using iStation. We also still have several that are using Lexia. Mm -hmm. All of those will be eligible for reimbursement. Yes, sir. So what we're dealing with is an inefficient system. Uh, and and I, I, we don't use that term as, as employees, but uh, 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 well, well, I'm elected. I can I know, say you that. You can say that. <laughs> well, no, no, my point is, and I don't mean negative, my point is that that support for reading is a critical, legitimate issue. Uh, this is not an efficient way. So as we're looking at our legislative agenda, as we're looking at ways to support our budget, we need to recommend something that is efficient uh, because I, you know, based on my background, I strongly support support for early reading. Uh, and I would like for us to make recommend that reasonable recommendations mm -hmm. that are not politically motivated uh, that actually address the issue of deficits in reading yeah. at the early level. Yeah. Each one of those vendors, Mr. Porter, each one of them will say their program is better than the other. Mm -hmm. And they've convinced school districts that theirs, whichever they chose, that theirs is the best. Oh, and my point is we need to we need to make decisions that are not vendor driven, that are based on what's best for kids and that and support for reading instruction. Uh, at the early level, early identification of reading deficits and uh, is very important. And I go into to Teach for America, I'm going to shift gears just a second. It also would be logical for us to support uh, efficient ways to get alternative people in the classroom. And Teach for America, even though my understanding is it's an excellent program, is also extremely expensive. So if we want to make recommendations and even use that money perhaps we need to through our legislative agenda again and i'm going to preach on that until we do it uh, 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 is to look for reasonable ways to provide all to help people to provide alternative ways if that's what if that's what the purpose of that is uh, we need to we need to quit making these decisions based on politics and keep and make these decisions based on what's best for the kids in our in our school regardless of what that is here's what kind of boils down to in a way do you want the school districts and their boards to, to choose let them choose the, the particular reading program that they think is best for them versus the law the extra cost that, that it will cost overbidding on one on a statewide basis. It's kind of a mm -hmm. counterbalance. In other words, you may want to talk to some of your people about that because how much is it worth it? Because <laughs> if we choose one, it'll be for everybody and that's it. And you, But you're going to be much more efficient, as Randy mentioned. Well, I was in the hearing room the day that they approved Lexia. It was the last day of a of a committee meeting. It was after they were getting ready to adjourn and it was thrown in and the person that made the motion didn't know what they were doing because they couldn't even pronounce the words. 
And so it was a last minute issue like that. It needs to be driven by those decisions need to be driven by student need, not vendors. Well, one thing about the, the advantage of the program here is school boards can choose the reading program they believe is best for them, but you're giving up the efficiency on a statewide bid. Right. So that's boils down. Ann Ma. Um, thank you. Well, follow up on what Jim said. I mean, the thing we have to keep in mind is this is stuff that somebody thought up at the legislature, threw in the budget, and then years later you're dealing with it and evolves and devolves, you know what I mean? Like this Lexia thing started out, not that Lexia is a bad program, I hear it's a good program, but the vendor had a friend in the legislature and they threw in what, six million bucks for it or something? And then eventually it gets cut and cut and cut. And now we're down to 1.2 million, that we don't even, we're still trying, I, figure out what to do with it, you know what I mean? Rather than, like you said, look at the big picture, like how would we, if we were to ask for extra money to invest in ways to get people licensed as teachers, how would you do it? Because Teach for America isn't it, you know? So we need a big, if we were gonna make a recommendation on funding to help licensure, we would back up, forget that, and think, you know, about how to do it, like Jim said, and it's the same way on reading. I think that the dyslexia task force has an opportunity to say, you know the governor will veto this again next year if it shows up, so forget that. Let's back away and say, do we need extra money above the $4 billion for reading program, or do we need to have a different approach and let the committee, I mean, you guys recommended some things we needed to spend money on, right? Let's go that way and just forget this, because it, it was just a friend, a, a gift to a friend, you know, that... And the same way, the tech ed started out as a million and a half to, um, and if you got some kid to get a certificate in high school, you got $1,000, okay? Now we're down from a million and a half to 80,000 that just pays for the testing, which I think is cool. I'm not too sure that's not a bad idea to leave that there um, because it, it they will do what you're incented to do. So some of this stuff, you have to remember where it came from and not try to turn it into something else, but maybe back up and go, if we were going to really do something for reading, what would it look like? Because it wouldn't be that. Does okay. that make sense? Go ahead, Neil. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention before we leave Teach for Americans, how many teachers do we have now, potential teachers do we have now in the transition to teaching program? I believe it's over 300 between Fort Hayes and Wichita State. And you know how much we're paying them? You got it. Okay. All right. This is easy. The legislature adopted, the governor signed the bill on school finance, and it's a, in the four-year program, and you'll notice this year it goes up, the base goes up 6.5% and 3% the next three years. You can see the dollar amount, so that's pretty well locked in. It's done. Now it's up to the court to say yes or no, but uh, I, I don't, Think it's they did what you asked them to last year, unless you changed your mind. Why we're that's that's already in place. Okay. Uh, supplemental general aid. This is kind of a little bit out of the ordinary too. This has been to the Supreme Court and back, and the court says you got to equalize it. Your old formula worked fine. So the bottom line is they reinstated the old state aid formula, and. Uh, and they've, they've accepted the fact that it has to be funded. That's a part of the package. So there's not a lot to do there either. And one more thing I need to mention on that. A lot have forgotten about this. When you get ready to compute your LOB budget, back several years ago, they included a base for computing that at 4490. 4490. And the law now kicks in this coming year that we will increase that by the uh, three-year average of the consumer price index, which is about 1.5%. So the LOB could have the potential of going up 1.5% So to keep it up to date. So is the LOB roughly 20 25% of what the base state aid is uh, just in round numbers. It, it, it's in, yeah, it's probably closer to thirty. Okay, about thirty. So 
to, but it, it will gradually grow. And, and part of that uh, waiting has to do with the number of students, the weight of students and all that. But I just want to mention the court, the legislature cut this back in these earlier years. And they said, court said no. So they went back and changed it and reinstated it. And since then, they've funded the law as it's written. So that, that takes a lot of pressure off the board because they pretty much adopted what you asked for in LOB and general fund. Uh, go ahead. That's just growth. Uh, capital improvement. Capital improvement, uh, that's really complicated process. <coughs> but, and there's all kinds of caveats. But if you're entitled to state aid, why it's, it's interesting, and we don't talk about this very much, but it, it's a demand transfer. It comes off the top. It don't take an appropriation. With me, it's not an appropriation. It's a they put the number in as to what it's going to cost, but it's a demand transfer comes off the top, so it's funded automatically. So if I if we miss that by one million dollars, one way or the other, you just fund the law, but but it comes off the top. That's significant. Now let me tell you one more thing's going to happen. July one of fifteen, they changed the law, and it's kind of a under the radar deal, there wasn't a lot of talk about it. And they lowered state aid on future bond issues. And it amounts to about 25 percentage points. So if you are at 25% uh, state aid under the old law, it's based on assessed valuation review, if you're at 25%, now you're down to zero. That, that applied on new bonds, not old bonds, but new bonds. And they also later, 17, I think it was, they put a cap on how much we're authorized to approve. And it's always based upon the preceding year's amount we paid off. How much did you pay off? That's one. Plus five-year producer's price index. So we take, we, and we've, we've had to collect that special, and we've got it. So whenever we know the producer's price index, we know what the cap will be. It'll be a little over 400 million. We know that. <laughs> well, and there's certain exceptions. If you haven't had a bond issue in 25 years that's passed, you're exempt from the cap. Uh, so th there's, there's caps, but the, and state aid has nothing to do with the cap. Nothing to do with the cap. That's, that's the equity piece. But I want, the reason I mention this is, this is going to grow for another year or two, a couple of years probably. Then I think it'll flatten out and it'll gradually start to go down. Dale, oh. there, there's two areas here that maybe board would like clarification on. There's capital improvement and then there's capital outlay. Can you explain the yes, difference between very easy. what they're used for? Capital improvement is bonds that are approved by the state and it's the state's share of those bonds that are approved by the voters. And if the voters don't approve it, you approve them, you give them the right to vote. Mm -hmm. But the decision is not made by you, it's made by the local voters. And that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. By the way, Gene, you had one go down this month, this week. At Oakley failed uh, on a bond issue. But many of the bonds, because we lowered the state aid and how we compute it, July 1 of 15, uh, there's a fair percentage of them that don't get state aid. <laughs> anymore. Anybody that's 25% or less, they're out of it. They don't get stated. And it's interesting to see uh, one of the last ones, or several of them, Hayesville, Dodge City, but remember the Dodge City bond issue? Uh, Gene, you remember that, that they had about uh, three or four years ago? They, they approved it on, in June, just before the law changed, July 1st, in June. So they're under the old law. So they get the high state aid. But if they have a new bond issue, they're on the low state aid. And it makes a big difference in property tax. But this is bond interest state aid. I wish they'd have called it that, but they didn't. Yeah. So then what, what can people use capital outlay for? All right. Let's go to the next one, that capital outlay. And then go, I, go I, I know Ann has a question, but let's do that. All right. Go ahead and okay. talk about the capital outlay. Capital outlay... School districts have the authority 
to run a resolution and they can go up to eight mills for capital outlay. That's the maximum. Even though you approve eight mills, the board can change and lower that any, each year they adopt their budget. But whatever they levy, depending on how poor they are or rich they are, however you want to look at it, it's based on assessed valuation because that's what they determine their wealth, they get state aid for that. And that amounts to about, well, you can see it there, $65 million this year. This, this, uh, this also was a court deal. Court said, you're, you're not equalizing, you had to go back, and so they did. And this has become, the last year or two, non-controversial since the court approved it. With me? But this is the local mill rate, and whatever, that, uh, whatever they raise, we have a, a percentage that we will pay based upon their wealth. And uh, this things that you can use for equipment, school buses, Roofs, repairs, heating, air conditioning. And by the way, that's if you ever notice the bond issues coming through, there's a fair percentage of it has to do with maintenance, air conditioning, repair, heating, windows, doors, and security. That makes up a lot of it. I'd say that probably makes up, well, I don't know, close to half maybe. The other half would be on new facilities. But a lot of it is maintaining what you got. So this, But this is a special mill levy. Uh, most districts have that, and if mill levy becomes mills become touchy, property tax wise, this is usually one place. Good, bad, right, or wrong, they'll lower it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ann Mall. Um, thank you. I know they've changed the law so much on capital improvement state aid. I really lost track of it. But are you saying the two hundred and fifteen million allocated for this coming year is for old bonds? It's for old and new bonds. It's both, but the majority of it is old bonds prior to July 1 of 15. <laughs> that we, they got 25% for? No. Is that they, no. The, uh, it, it's old bonds. I use that as an example, but some of them are real poor. They may go up to 50, 60%. Okay, so it was weighted based on It's their, weighted. It's based okay. on your wealth, how poor you are. So if they all these that we've just approved tentatively, they would get varying levels of support, yes. some and, zero and... And, and, and there's a good, fair, I'd say maybe a third of them will get nothing. And, it's all property tax. But it's all based on, and what would the max be they could get now? Oh, the, the max would probably be Galena, and it'd probably be in the, I don't know, 60, 65% range. Really? Okay, thank you. I didn't realize it still went that high. So, anyway, but they, they was, they would have been up considerably higher than that at one time. Uh, this is just maintaining the law, and, and it's been to court and back, so th this makes this a lot easier, too, since the court's approved. Dale, you may want to speak, and this would be a little bit hypothetical because we haven't really seen the full effect of, my opinion, of that 15 change of dropping down the state aid for bond issues. Okay. You want to talk about the okay. possibility, though, of the effect it may have for those districts that lost state aid on bond issues to try to put more money in their capital outlay to offset what they would have gotten on state aid. Does that make sense? Yep. And we don't. Th this is an unknown a little bit because we're seeing we're watching the transition, in, in, in as we speak, almost. Yeah. Is is there's an? It's not uncommon for school districts because of the mill rate on bonds, they may try to maximize their capital outlay to the full eight mills, and this has been approved by the court, and they get state aid on it higher. Capital outlay state aid is higher than bonds, the way it's computed. Capital outlay state aid is higher than bonds, so they'll try to go the capital outlay route. That's a good point. So, so Dale, can you give an example of a, a school district that would have lost state aid on bonds, gone to zero, and what their you may have, you may know, and what their state aid might be on capital outlay, for example. Well, it wouldn't be uncommon for them to go to zero on uh, on uh, bonds and be right on the border, but go to zero on bonds, and they might get state aid, uh, no, twenty five percent on capital outlay, or and may get may get that amount on uh, LOB state aid. But to get that, they have to pass the resolution and charge a mill levy. They can't just take it out of the base state aid that 
the new two hundred million? Because you guys were talking about no, 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 no. shoving money no, in. No, no, no. When you, and you, this is it was about kind of the all the bond attorneys and all that good stuff. The bottom line, all of the the payments for capital improvement state or, or the capital the bond interest. That's what that is. I wish they'd called it that. But if, if you go back to that. That money to pay that comes out of that bond interest fund. In capital outlay, they have up to eight mils, and you can accumulate that, and it always carries over cash. And uh, state aid on that is higher considerably than bond interest. And you oh. can transfer money into that. I was going to say, from general it doesn't have to be a yeah. special <laughs> levy. You could take money out of the base state aid we gave you and yeah. put and, it over and there. You can put it in capital outlay, but not capital improvement. But that's what you guys were talking about. We should tell them, do not take this $200 well, million and shove you, it over into capital you, you, outlay. See, it, you got to be reasonable about this. You need to value it. You need capital outlay because in case you lose a roof or you need some money in there. But on the other hand, you, you don't want to become a banker. And you want to be reasonable. It's a judgment call. And uh, if, if you're accumulating money in capital outlay, it's, it, it's a good idea to have a five-year plan. And it's what, you, what you're going to do, roofs and heating and air conditioning and all that. Uh, but you don't want to get carried away and, uh, and get too much money in capital outlay without a purpose. The purpose is very important. I, I think, you know, Ann mentioned this. You, there's a law, that any law that gets passed, and then you have to wait three or four years to see what the effect of that has operational. School districts, uh, like any business, you know, I mean, the tax law changes and businesses try to figure out how do we maximize our business for the tax law. So when this law changes, if you're running this, uh, you're thinking about your business managers, or, you know, uh, Becca doesn't have a business manager, so it's just her but and a clerk. But they're looking at that going, if I get 25% state aid and capital outlay and I don't get any bond and interest, why don't we maximize our capital outlay so I get some state aid on that and then utilize that to help offset what we might have to do in bond and interest because it makes sense economically and from a mill levy standpoint what, back what, home. When it gets sensitive, and this back to kind of you were talking about, it gets sensitive in some districts with staff and boards <coughs> is, is when you're using operating money for capital and state aid, capital outlay. That gets very sensitive. And usually it will come up in negotiations, uh, that issue. If you're transferring money from the general fund to capital outlay, a lot of times the teachers will say, will raise that issue. Well, I know some of them, I mean, during the really lean years, let their reserves get down to zero. And they really do need to build it back up at, the, to some the, level. But Yeah, our reserves are overall statewide are in very good condition. Have we, very good. I guess we'll redo that, take another look at in July about where they are in we terms can. of overall? We, we, we tell you what, and we get it every month. But July 1 date is the best date because you compare it prior years, beginning of the budget year. We won't get that information in officially until it comes into the budget, which will be 1st September before we get it. But you think we'll be around 14% or so again? Well, it depends on how you figure it. Uh, but in my opinion, if you're going to figure uh, cash balance and operating expenses, I would exclude bond interest. I'd exclude capital outlay. I'd exclude gifts and grants. I'd exclude food service. Food services, school district is a custodian trustee of that. That's mostly kids' money and federal money. State don't have already anything in that. Uh, but there's several funds that I'd exclude. Oh, activity funds. I'd exclude that. That belongs to kids as a general rule. That's the, and so exclude those funds. And, Ann, the last time we checked out a year ago, we was right at 15%. So, oh, the, we're, we're, having, we're seeing growth in cash and continues to reserve. That's, that's up. Okay. Uh, juvenile detention. Uh, this is pretty simple. Kids in juvenile detention facility they receive twice the base aid per pupil. So next coming year, it's $4,165. Two times that is what they get or what they spend, whichever is low. And you'll see there that we haven't raised that for quite a while, and there's a reason we haven't done that. Uh, some of those juvenile detention facilities and psychiatric residential treatment centers, they closed. They closed. We, we, we lost one in Newton a few years ago. 
We lost one in Dodge City not too long ago. Now, each county has to have access to a juvenile detention facility, but the psychiatric residential treatment centers, uh, several of those are closed. So we're in good shape there. We don't, we don't need any more money in that fund. Steve Roberts has a question. Yeah, I appreciate that. I don't know what part of our discussion is the appropriate time, so I'm just going to throw it out. And I apologize for messing with your flow, Dale. How could we, as a board, make a concerted effort to raise the, the overall percentage of money that goes to teachers, which I understand is about 50%, generally. And I think it ought to be closer to 70. I really do. I think we need to make a concerted effort to make more money go for teacher salaries. And seeing how all the pieces fit together, what I heard between the lines is, Maybe for early reading, maybe it isn't a program. Maybe it's bringing people into the schools who just want to help out with kids who just need somebody looking over their shoulder. And then we can hire the specialist to work with the kids who have real problems with dyslexia or whatever. See, Steve, the other thing we got to be real careful of is how you, we define teachers, because many people consider librarians, counselors, social workers as, as a teacher, and they're paid on the teacher salary schedule in many cases. But technically, when they're uh, in the budget, they're separated out. It's support service or uh, in many cases, many cases like that. And that's quite a bit of money. If you count that, uh, teachers make up about 50% of the general fund. But if you throw in those other things like that in total operating, we'd be up over oh, probably 65%, upper 60s, if you count all those. And so, but but it depends on your debt. Most even policymakers across the street will think of social workers like uh, social workers uh, and counselors, library. library. Oh, li boy, don't ever tell a librarian that they're not a teacher because I'm telling you, uh, they'll, you'll get to know your name. Uh, they'll, they'll, they're a very dedicated group, very dedicated. So well, anyway, so it depends on how you define it, but the teachers themselves make up about 50%. You know, those other folks are in the 15% uh, or more range. Yep. But if you add in, like, bus drivers and maintenance, all that, aren't you way up over 70%? Oh, in total salaries, the answer is yes. more like 80? Yes. Yeah. And if you get total salaries, yes, yeah. it's over 70. Yeah, yeah, you, you get, you, yeah. well, you got custodians, uh, uh, you know, classified people. That's a, a maintaining the school. Uh, and you got bus drivers. And i tell you what. It's in Bus drivers anymore is 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 a that's a pretty tough deal anymore. It's not like it used to be, and you're having trouble getting bus drivers. Uh, that they're tough to find. And uh, <laughs> I got a call a couple of years ago, from, and Gene's out in your area, and one of the districts raised the salaries of their bus drivers significantly. And a neighbor called up and said, "That just takes me off to no end." I said, "Why?" They was having they's hurting. And he said, yeah, but they're stealing all ours. So they're wanting to go there. I said, I got to raise mine now. So, I mean, that's what happens. But there's a, you got, you got to get the CL, CDL and, and also, but you think about it. And the, right now with all the traffic and the number of people that run those stop arms, and, and it just scares the living daylights out of you. And I can't believe this, but they, they got pictures of it, the guys do, where they may pass a bus on the, on the right side. You got it, you know, and, mm. but anyway, I think that law is going to get changed. But this is the biggest issue I think you've got to decide. And you'll have opinions. We added seven and a half million dollars to special ed, but folks, the excess cost on special ed, you, you add all that money in the general state aid and you only put seven and a half million dollars in special ed, the excess cost on special ed, we're supposed to pay 92% of the excess cost above the cost of a regular kid. Well, the regular kid goes up and special ed goes up a little bit. The percentage of excess cost is going down. And we think we're gonna drop state aid notice right here in 1819 to 1920, we're up about seven and a half million, but the percentage excess cost is going down to 78. And I'm telling you, and Let's go to the next one. And it will do that the following year. There's what's appropriated. It will do that the following year. I think we'll, we're going to drop another seven down another. Pardon? 
92 is in statute. Now, right here, we, we, we'll show it to you. Right here. In 2021, if you wanted to, we wanted to do something, to maintain it, uh, you, you wouldn't have to put any money in. In option two, if you want to go back to the 78%, which is what it was in this current year, it'll take 19 million. Go ahead. Then if you want to go to 92%, you phase it in last year, but you, these percentages, this is something we gave you to look at. You can set the percentage, but the law says 92, but that's each year what you'd have to have. So it would take significant amount of money uh, to get it up to the 92% in one year. But that's what the law says. So when we get ready to do this in, in next month, you can pick the percentage and I'll back into the money. That's not an issue. But, you know, if it's 92%, you want to phase it in over the next three or four years, or you want to do it all at once, you'll get to make that decision. Well, last year we recommended getting to 92% over four years, but now they've fallen farther behind, so now it's going to take even more money to catch that, up, right? You are correct, and yeah. and the other thing is the concentration in this session was all on the court case, which is a general fund, and special ed was not a, a player of consequence. Okay. Uh, parents as teachers, uh, for those that have the program pretty popular, well-respected, uh, love it, early childhood, one, a, a great foundation, help parents. It really it was uh, help parents become the child's first teacher. And here, here's some things to look at. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, if you want to add a couple, 2,000 children, we can, there's no magic to that, cost you a million four. You want to add 1,000 kids, 720,000. How much do you want to expand it and... Uh, you, you can't go too much in one year because they couldn't get it all implemented in one year because they got they got to be trained and all that. But this will be up to you. You want to expand, and this is one program where uh, we spend all the money. Spend all the money. <coughs> yeah. Do we have a known waiting list on that? Do we know how many kids are waiting? Or uh, I, I I'd have to tell. I'd have to go back and check, but usually it runs about over a thousand. Usually it runs over a thousand. Teacher mentoring program, this is a great program in a way. It, it assigns, one of the things that research has shown is that uh, new teachers, if they're not given a mentor, their dropout rate is gone, there is, is much higher. Sign a mentor, and what this program does, if the mentor's trained, you sign a mentor to them, and they meet the criteria, they get $1,000 each year. And this year, and thanks... Thanks to Jim Carlskin, and some of you may know him, former superintendent up at Holton. Uh, he's the one who says how important this is, and he was instrumental in getting us up to a million three. And to fund the law, it'll take an additional million seven. And if you want to fund the first two years, the law says three years. Three years, thousand dollars each year. We've never got the thousand dollars for three years. Not never got that much money. Take about a million seven to do it, but the first two years, we could, we could do it for a million. Okay. Uh, professional development. Everybody will tell you this is the secret to our success of professional development. And it's not like it used to be. You know, years ago, it brings somebody in, an expert, and they give a speech and leave, and they ignore it and go on. The professional development, a lot of times, is help is being developed by teachers. And Carlson had a big uh, effect on this. And... We got a million seven. That's 17, 18. That's because of him. If you want to fund the law, and by the way, this is in statute. It's in statute. You get a half of 1% of the general fund or actual expenditures, uh, whichever is the lower number. And you can see if you want to fund the law at different percentage levels, that's what it would be. Uh, when you say half percent of the general fund, is that by district? Like if my district yes. had a... Yes. $20 million budget they'd get. Yes. Okay. Yeah, each one of them is based on their general funds, and that's tied to their kids, so half 1% of their general fund. Now, this is not by law. This is the transportation statute, but if you wanted to lower the mileage, there is, this is, the things I talked about so far have been statutory. This is not statutory. There's a statutory in the formula, but 
to lower the mileage, it takes a change in law, and that tells you what it costs. And usually, everybody's in favor of lowering the mileage on transportation, but it's usually about fifth on the priority list. And it's, it's a board decision, but that's roughly what it would cost. If you ever notice, when you build a school, when you build a school, it wasn't long houses are all around it, and they want they want to be close to school. And but anyway, that that's one that we'll need to decide whether we want to do anything there or not. The law says we'll pay six cents on each school lunch. Not a big deal. Not a high dollar amount. It ain't going to make a lot of difference one way or the other. There's a federal match, and we meet the federal match. Go ahead, and. Uh, we meet that. If you want to go to six cents, as the law provides, it takes nine hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Now, bear in mind, and the federal government in food service, and this is counting daycare, child care, is about two hundred million dollars. So uh, that's about it's by far the largest federal program we got. Nothing's within fifty, sixty million. So if you want to do that, six cents, that's that's a law. This is not a law. This is something the state board has done on their own, but they thought it was the right thing to do. And over the years, the board has asked, and we put in the budget money for ag in the classroom. And it's a program. It's housed at K-State, but the, uh, it's independent. They're 501c3, and it's always a dollar-dollar match. And they go out and uh, uh, raise money on, on their own to pay their half. They have a staff member, and they do a lot of summer training for teachers. Pardon? Those are two. So, and we have not participated in recent years. We've asked for it, but they haven't done it. Okay. Dale, who pays the match? Hmm? Who pays the match? Uh, it's, it'd be farm organizations in this case. Some place like um, Farm Bureau. They, soybeans. they receive grants from... Yeah. Agencies as well as the agri tag yeah. that thing that you see on the back yeah. of vehicles. They they, they have real good support from the ag community. It's it's kind of shocking a little bit that the training they go through and and help teachers <clears throat> uh, in the classroom as it relates to ag. Yeah, the other challenge I've had is that because of the prices, those ag groups, the mm -hmm. sorghum. They don't have as much money to give because their farmers can't donate to them as much as they have in the past. So they're they're struggling trying to find those gaps because they're getting less and less money from mm -hmm. from the crop people. Green because prices the, are down, plus we're flooding. Yep, that's true. Okay, communities and schools is another group. It very supportive. It's in several school districts now. Wichita's got a big community and school program. I think Garden City does. Several of them around, and but the bottom line is. They have not put any additional money in since 1415. The board last year, I think we put some money in for some of those. Okay. So are they still getting 250 or zero? The, the, when I no, say that, there's nope, no money. Nope. Okay. And the only thing that we have, there's a trust fund. They get $50,000 a year from that trust fund, and that's all. But the legislature did the, the uh, go ahead. The, the, the uh, legislature, one more. Uh, they're the ones that put the 250 in for two years, and that went away. Okay. Uh, conservation, remember some of you have been around a while. That's a not-for-profit. Uh, they do a lot about conservation and environment. They do a lot of great work, and they struggle financially. <coughs> the board wanted to help them. There's, you pick the number. Uh, they have to Whatever we give them, they have to match it dollar for dollar. I'd like to say all three of these groups do amazing things in our schools. I serve on the conservation and environmental education group, and I'm telling you, it's amazing what they do, you know, and, and it's a shame that they don't get this. It doesn't seem like that much. I mean, you know, because what they're doing in our schools is unbelievable. So I'm very supportive of it, so we'll see what happens. Okay. Uh National Board Certification. Remember, if you go through the National Board Certification, it's about like getting another degree. Uh, Emporia State University is the support system for that. Uh, the law says, it's statute, 
they get $1,000 per year for 10 years, then they, they can also go through a process and renew that, and I think it's up to five years. Uh, we're in good shape there. We don't need more money. Uh, Pre-K pilot. The pre-K pilot is half, uh, most of that is kids three years old, uh, three years and under. There's a few four-year-olds in it, and it has also some non-for-profit. This program was started by the governor's cabinet when they moved it over, the legislature moved it to us, and now, uh, and part of that's, uh, the governor had an influence on this, uh, about half of it now is TANF and half of it is CIF, that's uh, the uh, tobacco money. Half state and half federal. And uh, that program, we're okay. We, we, we'll, have, we'll have some carryover this year. Uh, tech Ed Transportation. Remember when, when the Governor Brownback was a big pusher of uh, the Tech Ed program where juniors and seniors could go to, to uh, Tech Ed or Community College and uh, we'd pay the bill, state would. He wanted to put money in for transportation. Well, notice, we got $650,000, and notice it's been rather consistent. And the number of kids in the program have more than doubled. So if you wanted to fund that, it'd, take, uh, you'd have to about double it, but it's only more than double. You got a 38% proration. And all that is, is to transport kids to and from the technical schools or community colleges for tech ed. Let me, let me just say, this is a really a big issue in rural communities that are far from a community college. So I always think of Ashland. It's far, fairly far away from Dodge. And when you want to encourage more kids to go get a certificate or a, a associate degree, not funding the transportation then for it because the dollar amount stayed the same and now we're increasing kids really hampers those rural communities. It doesn't hamper if, you know, if you're in Hutchison and, you know, the community colleges, you can, you can walk right there. It really hampers your rural communities. And you'll hear that, for those of you that have a lot of rural communities, large distances from community colleges, and they'll say, well, we'd like to send more kids, but they're having to drive themselves and then there's a cost there and, or we have to absorb the cost. And so this is one that could have some influence. The big issue too, in letting them drive themselves, eh, it gets a little shaky on liability and all that. And they're, on, they're in, enrolled in school, in school and all that it gets shaky. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, let me give you two examples right quick. There's a facility east of Iola in the city of La Harp, a little small community. Several districts went together. A guy gave them a facility for pretty near nothing, and they've got two or three community colleges in there providing services. And so that's an example where it's expanded. Also, there's one, I think, Jim, in Pittsburgh, out towards the airport, where they a facility where they got for career tech ed to expand it, and it's all offered is a general rule by technical school or community college, depending on what programs that, that they uh, chose. So there's, that's, that's getting to be pretty common, and it's a great idea. Three or four school districts go together, and they set up a program and work at the community college or technical school. Okay. Uh, discretionary grants. These have been around a long time. They're after-school programs. They were, and the sponsors are still in the legislature or in the governor's office. And you'll notice in, when money got tight in 11, 12, they got cut just about in half. And it's for after school programs. It's very limited, not much money. Uh, but it's uh, the one thing to think about is to go back to where it was in the beginning. Back up one. Uh, see, notice in 10, 11, how much we had? Been cut in half, been that way for several years. That plant, that program ain't going anywhere. I mean, it, those that got it, great, but it is, it's not going to expand with those dollars. Uh, Didn't we have good care with our boys and girls program like that? Yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, 
I, I can't say that name, but I know there's some in Wichita that with their not for profits. Yeah, I'm not sure who they are, but there's several of them. This that is involved. Uh, certificates for high need occupations. We have need for employees. They, they recognize they get a certificate to do that. And uh, those certificates, the school's supposed to get $1,000 per person, that had, and they've kind of backed off on that. <clears throat> and uh, this year, you'll notice we got $800,000, and next year it goes to $80,000, and the $80,000 just pays for the test, just for the test. And uh, so that's something that you, that you may want to give thought to, that do you want to continue to pay for the test? For some kids, paying for that test is kind of important if they're real poor. And so, and the $1,000 to the school district is a different ball game. They had to pay for half the test, but if you, paying for the test sure has some merit. Okay. Uh, the evidence based reading program, uh, you'll notice it's 2.1 million, and we went to 1.2. And we left that in there, <laughs> uh, recommended no funding, but they all rode the governor's veto in 1920. Go ahead. And so we got a million two back, I think, uh, in 1920. And we'll have an indication where the governor stands on that probably by the time your next board meeting is. Uh, and, but the bottom line is she recommended zero and now that program is limited to K through pre-K through three, and it's also uh, the school district choose the evidence-based program, and then you have to sign off on the evidence-based programs. If they choose one of those, they're in for about $8, $9 a kid. Uh, we have a, in our budget, and this came from outside the agency originally, it provides $500,000 for us, the agency, to contract, in essence, with Microsoft, where any of the, any kid can take those certificates, those tests, those certificates, free of, free, free of cost. Don't cost them anything. 17, 18, we had 2,147 students receive certificates. It, it's really, and then I want to mention one more thing. Back up one. Last year, and this, it's, it's a bid contract, and also the Board of Regents cooperates and works with on this. But they, uh, they had to have a little bit more money. So we, we went the extra $7,000, but it came out of statewide activities for Carl Perkins. So you'll notice that if to continue that, we're probably, go ahead, we're probably looking at about 515000 but. Not a bad bargain for 2,147 percent because many of the certificates, those kids, many of them go out and get a job right on the spot. Many of them will pay, get paid as well as a beginning teacher. This unusual program, the only one like it in the state that's getting paid for. It's a juvenile transitional crisis pilot in Beloit. The legislature did this a year ago. The governor left it in the budget, and there was no discussion hardly on it. Uh, Beloit. Gets three hundred thousand dollars for a transitional crisis pilot program. A lot of them are students that are emotionally, social, emotionally uh, uh, disabilities, and some at, uh, at identified as at risk. But that goes and that covers an area around Beloit. Not a bad program, I imagine a lot. But it's it don't it's not going anywhere. With me. What about the rest of the state? It's not going anywhere. So do you want to continue that or drop it? That'll be the, uh, the issue. Do we know, does that have any relationship? Does it look at all like the other mental health pilot? Are they doing the same thing? Could it be worked in with that? There's some, but not. They're much more hands-on. Okay. Much more hands-on. Much more. Uh, safe and secure schools. Remember, we got $5 million in it. We got $5 million again. Do you want to continue that safe, secure program? This year, they continued it. They stuck a proviso in the appropriation bill. They limited it to primarily for doors, windows, for entrances, what they limited it to. 
and we'll come to next month. We'll come to you with an uh, for this year with a uh, suggestion, and we'll act. We'll meet with the high patrol, the adjutant general, attorney general, uh, fire marshal, and all them, and they'll go through all that and look at it, and we'll have a recommendation as to how we should uh, distribute that money. But I promise you, it will be a lot more than five million. Dale, yeah, it's just a match one. They have to match the, the local district has to match. Yep, sure do. Yep, they have to match. Yep. Uh, Mental Health Intervention Project. That's a project that was started this year. was the first year. Next year, it's funded at about the level you see on the screen. And the question is, uh, do you want to continue that program? The number of dollars, this is another program, the, the, we're going to get a request for a lot more money than we got on this. Give me an example of what I mean. Remember we had the two and a half million for the online data system? Well, we only spent about 250,000, but we did it ourselves. So the, the bottom line is uh, they left the same amount of money, but in essence, but changed it and they made one big change in addition. We will only we'll fund 75% of the salaries for the school liaison. Last year we paid 100. They didn't have anything in it. This year we pay 75%. So the money we saved there, plus the money we saved in the uh, online data system uh, will be used for expansion. Bottom line, you're looking at probably uh, $3 million at the most, 2.7 to $3 million that for expansion. And on statewide, that ain't very much. Not very much. Okay. Uh, ACT work keys. Uh, that has worked super well, I think. And Randy's precise intellectual negotiations. Is that the proper term? Uh, why, we got pre-K ninth grade added to that. The pre the pre pre-ACT for ninth graders. Right? That's a good deal. No additional cost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let me make sure that everyone understands. For this year, any ninth grader will be able to take a pre-ACT exam at no cost in any district, along with any junior taking an ACT or any junior taking the work keys, or they could take both as a junior. And that's no cost, and the school must afford them the opportunity to take it. And that's public school kids only. It's public yes. school kids only. We get that question rather frequently, and it says school district. That's pretty clear. Randy, uh, when we do this, it, it, is it, if I remember right, everybody had to do it on the same day, or could they choose and pick times? Because for some schools, that's easy to implement. For other schools, especially larger ones, it can be kind of a challenge to, to implement it on. ACT and uh, chooses the date for ACT and work keys. We get no choice on that. There's a makeup day, but they determine pre-ACT, Beth Foltz, there, we can determine the window. Now we have to determine it as a state. And I know Beth's working with several, she's got a little uh, group that she's working with to determine when to do that. So we, we do get to determine okay. when to do the freshman. Well, I just heard from some larger schools and districts that it's it, but there's challenges because they pick the date and the date nobody talked to them. So it's good to know we're talking to Yeah, them. the ACT and Work Keys, Jim, we, they, we yeah. just, that's a national, uh, what they call national school date that they, they dictate to us. But also, Jim, they have an a alternative date if you can't make it. Like one schools, they weren't in school that day. So they, they just made, did the mark makeup day. They won't do it for the entire freshman class. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a, it, it, they're, they're implementing a, te a full test day the, is, the, is a bigger issue for larger schools than it is for smaller schools. It's an issue for all schools, but certainly at larger schools and districts. And, and the advantage of the pre-ACT, we will determine a window, not just a test date. So there will be a window to be able to give it, which will give a little bit more flexibility. Just to make sure we're talking to them, yeah. not just telling them. No, but we are. The, yeah. the date for the actual ACT, I thought, is that on a school day? Because I thought they yes. were providing that. Okay. Yes. Well, the, the, that's, there's two different dates, Steve. There's the national, you go to some center and take the ACT on a Saturday. Those are published. Right. 
Then there's what ACT calls the school dates. When those are, no, those are a date in February uh, and then a date make up in April. And then there's, and that's, that's dictated by ACT. I think what Steve is saying though is I think though those dates are known. Ahead yes, of time. they are. They're yes, well they are now. Out. Yes. Yeah. So, and any other programs is going to cost money that you want to bring up now or next month? Is appropriate. Yeah. They'll do when it. we look at these, one of the things, you know, and I'm going to turn to Jim and I see your name on there, mm -hmm. uh, because the group, the dyslexia group that's working on recommendations, I'm assuming there's going to be, or potentially will be a dollar figure attached. That's what that, I okay. <laughs> then why don't you <laughs> jump in there, Jim? I, I don't know what the number is. That's something we'll have to work on, but the, the dyslexia task force made three recommendations to the legislature for funding. And I would like for us to consider putting those in our, and then one of them may not be appropriate because one of them is for professional development to those people in the higher education institutions who are teaching reading so that they have the skills necessary to teach structured literacy. Yeah, that now that, in, border regions, yeah. that in Cape, but perhaps, uh, and I'll be glad to do this, but we need to contact the Board of Regents and ask them to put that in their budget request. Would that be appropriate? The, the, would that be a, the appropriate thing to do? Sure. And we've got sure. a million, and we were talking about that million and two, that's a, that's a political football. Uh, the other two requests uh, that were made were, was to support professional development for existing teachers. That The first one I talked about is for pre-service teachers. So that would help pre-service teachers. Uh, the second request was to provide uh, funding for the second level evaluation. Now, the screening is relatively inexpensive and quick. Uh, so that's, uh, that was not a request from the Dyslexia Task Force. But the, the evaluation for those people that screen and that need extra help can be lengthy and expensive. And so that is a request uh, from there, and then to, to support professional development for existing teachers. Uh, so we'll have to work between now and, and to come up with a reasonable number, uh, and uh, $1.2 million probably won't do it, but I think that would be a more appropriate use of funding that actually impacts what happens in the classroom than, uh, than $8 a student. Just, I have a, just the, the uh, think about this, if we funded the professional development piece, the, the, the regular law, that would take care probably of the, the professional development part, and the board could make that a part. Okay, so we could we could use that as part of our justification for increasing that to yes. whatever the law is supposed yeah. to be. They don't take the second level, but their professional development, rather than getting one for each program, you could do it. If we fund the, the one we got, they could do that with that and... And another thing, I, you know, I, we've had, uh, we've, this is completely different subject. Uh, we have had recommendations or we've had pro, uh, presentations on this breakfast program and the incentive, uh, the, uh, the alternative breakfast program, which apparently is being relatively successful. We're going to get pressure uh, to uh, require certain things. Uh, and I think that it's always best to incentive than it is to require. And I'm wondering if we could consider uh, an allocation, part of a penny, a penny or something like that, per our alternative breakfast to give people the incentive to uh, operate those programs, which we have, uh, Cheryl Johnson can give you, all sorts of data that shows the, the, the positive impact on academic performance for kids that are did, did that are ready to come to did, school. Did, Jim, and this year we only have two districts that didn't do that. I I don't I don't know the answer to when that. Am I right? The breakfast break. Only had two. At no, that's waiver. that's a different thing. I'm talking about alternative yeah, breakfast. Yeah. Breakfast. Okay. Yeah. Second chance. Breakfast. Second chance breakfast. Uh, bre you know, right. they have all sorts gotcha. of things like that. And gotcha. so we're really pushing for people to have that second chance because uh, 
you know, if the bus gets in late, you don't get breakfast, that sort of thing. So some, some alternatives to that. So instead of requiring it, which we're going to, at some point, we may not do it, but we'll at least be requested to do that. I think it's much more positive if we say, hey, we would like for you to do this. And not only that, we're going to give you a, a little insignificant. but it is, And we have some support from other agencies uh, to help people with some funding too. But I would think that that you know, the, in my conversation with some of those people on on that committee, uh, they really want us to say you have to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find, uh, as a you know, from what I used to do for a living, I find if you tell me I'm going to encourage you and give you a little help, I'm much more likely to do it willingly uh, mm -hmm. than if you tell me I have to do it because then I'm going to rap and whine for a while and maybe not do it as effectively as I would otherwise. So I'd like for that. I don't think I'd be cost much money, but I think that that would be a real positive we'll way to it. incentivize okay. that. Um, and Ma. Yeah, the only other thing, at one time, I know, Randy, we talked about, was there any way we could put that first 15 money in our pot, but it looks like it probably needs to go to the Regents? The way we've approached it so far is it would go to the region's budget, similar to tech ed uh -huh. initiatives. Yeah. You'd have to view it a little bit differently, I think, with the funding, because right now they get the state aid reimbursement for tuition credit. Right. So I think if we did it, if the recommendation was differently in, we'd want a deep conversation with the Board of Regents before we probably made that recommendation. Do you know what they asked for this year, if they did any specific amount of money for that? I don't know, but I do have. Isn't that it? Did they? Did they put? I mean, it went, it went, it's, it, it's not, they were very, it was reasonable. Well, they, they could do it. They were probably just going for three hours. I think they were going for a start, like oh, a we'll start. pay for the first three but hours. It'll be the really whole thing difficult was gonna philosophically. For us to give money to the regions, it, it, have to, it has to come through the regions. So we could just encourage them to keep going for we that? We could have that as a policy, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, the research on completion, um, it says that if a student can take and pass about a semester's worth of college work, uh, they greatly enhance the opportunities to go on and further their education and complete. And that's why it wasn't just arbitrarily chosen as 15. That would be a semester's worth of work. There's not, and while it goes up, if you complete a year, the big bang is that first semester. You get a little bit of bump, but not so much for the money. And that's why it was never recommended to go above 15. Because I know there were some legislators concerned, well, if you go 15, then you're going to want 40. You're going to want 60 hours. You do get a bump of completion. But if you really look, the bump happens within the first semester. You can pass 15, you know, a, a semester worth, and you can show that kids will go on, and that's that's where the level is. Oh, we'd have to talk to him, but I know one time, you know, we were trying to work out a figure, not your usual rate per hour, but what would you charge us for the high they, school kids? They've got a number. I just don't have it memorized. They've got it a number. About, it computer. was about $25 million. Okay. Yeah. If, but every, if every student. Right. Every senior took 15 credits, so that would that would be the. It's kind of like we did ACT. 2.8 million is if every student takes work keys and every student takes well, the ACT. Well, that was though only paying them about 50 bucks a credit hour, which they faunched at. But if we but, could come up with an agreement on a rate per hour. Well, that was whatever the board of regents came up with, what they thought the reimbursable yeah. was. Okay. Yeah. Cool. The, the the and Blake Flanders has been very supportive of that concept. He, yeah. Steve Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dale, tapping into your wisdom and expertise for the little ones. Uh, there's, there's two big picture things I want to mention to you and get your feedback. One is I'm sitting here thinking about about a half dozen websites, programs, totally free that would help kids learn arithmetic. If do we, do I want to try to use professional development funds to to bolster that, do I want to just, you know, uh, beat the bully pulpit? How do I, if if there's a half dozen places out there where virtually every primary school teacher who teaches math could benefit from, how do I get that out there? Hey, if if I was doing that, I would send it to curriculum directors, 
We have a list serve which curriculum letters if there's a program that would help them. I'd send it to people who's going to be directly involved. Okay, appreciate that. The other thing is, what are the, the difficulties or the obstacles to moving the traditional break between primary and secondary, which for most of us, we agree, is 6th to 7th grade, 5th to 6th, 6th to 7th, right in there. What would it take to move that a little earlier in a child's life? What would it take to collectively move the system so that we have a mindset that, you know, primary pretty much finishes when a kid's 8 or 9 years old? Because now they've learned to read, right? We've all heard that. We, we first learn to read, then we read to learn. What would it take to actually move the system from a mindset that, well, primary is the first half, secondary is the second half, to maybe make that division happen a little earlier? Okay, two things. One is I can think of, one is you need to review that uh, and take a look at it. The board had to be, get an agreement, and then you'd have to review that in light of the accreditation rules. And I think it's a law. The other thing, too, is you'd have to look at in, in that process is, and we, nobody likes to say this, but a lot of that is based upon facilities. The facilities would be the biggest issue of all. And the effect of that. And that would take time. Yeah. Okay, board members. So in July, Dale will be back with us, and we will be looking at the budget again. And we'll be making recommendations in each category. So you might want to take a look at this again and give some thought and maybe visit with others. I'm sure you can call Dale if you've got questions on anything, especially that capital. It, it, that yeah. always is a big issue. And we'll be voting on what some recommendations would be. And again, this one's not near as significant as the previous one was. because, And maybe by, well, by July we should have the court case information. Yes, we will have by then. Yeah. And if, if the court uh, approves, then the a lot of this will be done for us. Mm -hmm. The general fund, supplemental general. Right. And all that. So that'll be done for us. So, yeah, we'll be back. And uh, the, of all this, the, the hard part will be for deciding on special ed because that's where mm -hmm. big, the big issue is on money. And then we may have a few other individual ones like oh, yeah, there'll dyslexia. Be, there'll be some, and, yeah. Right, yeah. but th that's where the big dollars are. Okay, looks like you have some more things to hand out for us, or? Nope, I don't think, no, you've already got it. Oh, it's immaterial. We changed one number on there, and, and it's just an update copy of what's in your board book, one. And okay, two well, is, we gave you. That's probably good for people to have, then yeah, they can take yeah, that home and is, look we, at it. A, it's a letter of the evaluation from uh, Beloit. Okay. All right. Very good. So thank you for your time. Okay. I appreciate it very much just the family visit. Thank okay, you. You bet. Thank we'll you, Dale. You. Bye -bye. Okay. Uh, board members, we'll take a break, and then we'll be back. We've got a couple other topics to discuss, so let's be back at 5 till. Thank you. I would like to let folks know we've actually got quite a few members that have some meetings, so we're on kind of a tight timeline. I know uh, Janet and I think Ann have something at noon. Yeah. And Randy and I have to be over at KASB at 12.45, and Dina goes to KSHIP. So we're, several of us are double booked today, so we do have several, a couple more items, and then we have our own uh, agenda items to cover. I know, for instance, Mr. Porter's going to update us on the school arm stop school bus stop arm. I'm not saying that quite right, but you guys understand that we've actually talked a little bit about it. So we do have a few items to cover today. Uh, if you'd quickly take a look in your agenda, we are looking at uh, briefly the calendar year 2020 and the calendar year 2021 board meeting dates. And if you take a look at those, these are all on the second Tuesday and Wednesday of the month. <coughs> Excuse me. Except in the year 2020, we do have one uh, potential glitch I'll point out. If you look, November 10th, Tuesday is fine, but November 11th is the state holiday for Veterans Day. So obviously we won't be meeting that day. So we will either in November of 2020, 2020 we will either have a one-day meeting 
or I suppose we could do a Monday, Tuesday if we feel the need for a two-day meeting. So now we'll, this is a receive item today. So we will vote on this next month. So that is kind of for your information, Randy. One of the things uh, to consider since it's, you know, out of ways, uh, many organizations uh, plan around your schedule. Mm -hmm. And even though you could announce we're going to do a Monday, Tuesday uh, on that year, it will throw them <laughs> just because it's out of the ordinary. So you may want to think, I'm not encouraging one way there, just really may want to think, could we that month do a one-day meeting mm -hmm. just on Tuesday only? Uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday, uh, instead of, um, you know, having that happen. So. so that's for us to think about. And again, we'll vote on this next month. That's in 2020. Then in the 2021 schedule, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's all a Tuesday, Wednesday second Tuesday and Wednesday of the month each time. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Again, our only little glitch is the one on uh, November in 2020. So, and again, that'll be a vote for next month. So no real big issues there. Okay, our next item is to discuss teacher vacancy and supply. And... Um, Michelle is here, and I'm going to chat about this also myself, and uh, Jean is clear currently um, <coughs> were the two state board representatives on teacher vacancy and supply, and I asked um, Peggy to make another copy of this, and this is being handed out now, but I think Randy put this in the board, Friday board notes a couple of weeks ago. I don't remember exactly when. But um, I kind of want to talk from this. So if you look at the teacher vacancy supply memo that's coming to you, and it's a front and back, so, uh, and I'll have Michelle give us a little more detail when we jump into this, but the teacher vacancy supply was established out of the Blue Ribbon Task Force, really looking at the vacancy and the supply concerns in the state of Kansas. We all know those well. So uh, we have met really pretty much every month, either in person or via a Zoom meeting for this to study information. Um, several things we've done, you can see on the sheet, we've, uh, we have, uh, we did create the two-year mentor, uh, two-year mentor program to aid in retention of our teachers. Dale kind of alluded to that in our conversation on budget when we talked about mentor teachers uh, to, as far as supporting that program. Uh, I do feel like that's been successful. Uh, Michelle, do you have any feedback on that you want to provide for us, the mentoring program? Not, not much other than the uh, availability of supporting those districts and assistance with those with, with that financial piece is extremely important, and it, mm -hmm. it's a detailed process we work through in my office and are able to fund all of those and some of the second years with a small stipend as well. Okay. So that, I think we've had some success with that. Uh, that's going uh, pretty well, and I'm, I'm certain they probably want to continue. And you have a question? Yeah, a couple. Is there anything else that you guys thought our board should be doing that we haven't done, like be top of the list? Uh, as far as mentoring is concerned? Or no, I mean the whole Blue oh, Ribbon yeah, Task yeah. Force thing. Yeah, there, there are. That they're going to continue to work on that? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. The Absolutely. other thing I'd, I'd really like you guys to take a look at um, is it wasn't um, the task force made recommendations for us, but also the legislature and local boards. Right. And I'd be interested to see if either the legislature or local boards did any of the things that the task force recommended for them. Because if not, we need to say, hey, it's a team sport. Here's the role you guys have, and maybe you ought to step up. Or maybe they've done them all. I don't know. Uh Probably not, but we can certainly put that on the agenda for our meeting. Okay. I think this month we're having a Zoom meeting, and then I can't remember when the next month meeting is, but probably not July as we have a tendency not to meet. Because I don't know, maybe KASB took that list of things for local boards and they're working on it, but if not, they ought to be. Yeah. So. Agreed. Uh, two pilot initi initiatives that have started and really are going pretty well. Uh, the elementary pilot uh, that was created to allow, as you can see here, non-education degree candidates 
And uh, we've got a couple universities, uh, several of them, but a couple of them are really going great guns on this and have got a lot of uh, teachers in classrooms. I mean, who would have believed four or five years ago that elementary teachers would be a shortage area? But all of you probably understand that that has happened. And so we've got a couple of really innovative programs that are going and uh, we're having some good success. So Michelle, some update there. 126 total licenses have been issued for those two pilots. Uh, the more of those licenses are in the special ed pilot, there are less than 25 in the elementary pilot. So that's 126 seats, teachers that have been, that were filled in this last year due to those pilots. And that special education pilot is really pretty creative how, how some of these folks are doing that. They're getting special education paras. And, you know, a lot of our school districts who have shortages, certainly in special education, are school districts, small rural school districts. And, you know, uh, so they are able to put the paraprofessionals through this program. The paraprofessionals are going to stay there. You know, they're, they're not going to go away to college and then decide they want to move to the big city. So they are invested in that community. So they they are be able to get into this program uh, and a lot of support, and then end up becoming uh, the special ed teachers of record. And we are having some success with this program too. So Michelle, and, and to your point, this is an area where I think you'll see us bring a recommendation to continue this work based on the evaluations that we receive from candidates and systems colleges that have used this pathway okay. to the classroom. I'm also here in some things and. I'll have to get, well, you and I are going to meet anyway about some stuff, but that some districts are, I don't know if they're using this or they're they are trying to squidgy around some of the rules we wrote to actually make student teachers the teacher of record and start paying them before they get licenses to teach. You actually can pay student teachers. That is legal to do. And make them the teacher of record? Well, teacher of record, no. But they, they can, you can now pay student teachers uh, and, you know, a licensed person has to be the teacher of record. Um, but they're but, the only one in the room. Okay. I well, mean, <laughs> I've had conversations with systems and districts about yes. that, and, and I feel like it's my responsibility to uphold the opportunity for that candidate to have that student teaching experience, not as the teacher of record. Yeah. Okay. Well, when I get some more details, we'll talk. So, again, these programs are pilots and... Um, They've uh, overall been going pretty well. Uh, one of the things we continue to look at, um, and actually I heard from a phone conversation, was on my way up here Monday with my uh, local large universe, large uh, district, and so no secret well, who that is. They currently have 11 <laughs> science vacancies. 11. So science continues to be a huge issue as far as still... I mean, probably our most significant vacancy, wouldn't you say, Michelle? It's hard I, to say. It is hard to say because I get calls on PE vacancies and social studies vacancies. Mm -hmm. it, it just depends on where you are yeah. and what position at that time is immediately open for you. It's a serious issue when that lands in your lap. So the committee is still looking at the science uh, and, you know, what can we do? Actually, we're studying it, and I think Susan sent out a survey mm -hmm. recently. And so we'll be getting information back from across the state from the survey and uh, trying to find out and come up with some recommendations uh, as far as the science concerned. Math has actually gotten a little better, believe it or not. I think the recommendation not. that we brought to you all that you supported to change those levels of licensure helped in the systems because mm -hmm. they were looking for more lower level math instructors than they were the higher level math. Yeah, so um, although math is still a vacancy area, I don't think it's I mean, even as critical as it was, but, you know, it will continue to be a, an issue. Um, a restricted license, anything you want to say about that one? It's a, it's a super program, and uh, you heard Dale mention this morning that there are over 300 candidates that pursue that avenue, and it has really helped fill some of those content areas for folks in the, in the system that are looking for candidates, and it, it costs you all nothing. And this is the restricted program is really, that's really secondary. Correct, so, secondary and, content. And secondary content, and you know, so the somebody that comes in with a biology degree or 
you know, they could have a business degree and they come in and want to teach. So there's a variety of ways. Randy? Yeah, just, just so everyone understands, we're, we throw out a lot of terms and restricted, you would have a degree in a content such as an accounting. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to ask you to teach accounting and transition to that. And then the transition really is to help you in classroom management, pedagogy, et cetera. Right. right. Dodd City really does a nice job they with do. their transition program. Jackie Feist is a rock star on many levels, but she really, if you ever want to have a conversation about how to do transition well, Jackie can school you on this is what they're going to need above a, someone else coming out because she has had so many and she just has that experience of what they will need to be Highly successful. Highly mentored as they go through that process. That's where part of their success comes from. Now, as the uh, somebody mentioned, as far as teacher vacancy and supply and looking at the Blue Ribbon Task Force, one of the things we did at one of our recent meetings was spend really quite a bit of time going back through the recommendations and looking because, you know, we immediately jumped in and said, you know, what are our what are our quick hits that we've got to do? And so, you know, we did the mentoring. We looked at a couple pilot programs, uh, the math, you know, some of those things. But then we, we went back and revisited the Blue Ribbon Task Force and really kind of wanted to take a look at what are some of the other suggestions in there. And one of the things that we'll be doing really fairly soon is the uh, marketing group here mm -hmm. from uh, KSDE will be coming and meeting with the 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 teacher vacancy and supply committee and really taking a look at, you know, sometimes we don't market ourselves real well. And sometimes uh, educators, we're not good at marketing anyway. So we're really going to take a look at what do we do? What can we do? Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, K-State developed some really nice uh, things that could go on TV, but, you know, there's the financial piece. How do you get them on there? So we're going to take a look at what are some things we can do as far as assisting with the marketing piece of, of the profession and of encouraging folks to go into education. I think one of the things that we'll probably take a look at again is um, some of our grow your own type programs. Uh, when I talk to particularly um, uh, some of our more diverse districts that talk about wanting to have more diverse candidates in the classroom. And if you really look at, you know, well, maybe the way to do that is to grow our own teachers. Um, you know, Garden City, Dodge, liberal, high Hispanic population, you know, kind of taking a look at how do you, how do you grow some of your own Wichita, KCK, uh, Topeka, high minority populations. What do you look at to grow your own teacher programs? Uh, some of our school districts are currently doing that. Uh, in Wichita, I know they've started with a, a para option with some of their recent graduates. They're going to hire them as paras, get them into classrooms, and get them into College of Ed and help support them through some of that. So we're going to kind of take a look at some of those things, too. Uh, so we are going back and revisiting the Blue Ribbon Task Force recommendations. Michelle? Today, you've shared a couple of other things that we'll add to that agenda as well. It was important for this group to go back and prioritize those recommendations from Blue Ribbon Task Force, and that's exactly what you did. Uh, I would take the opportunity to tell that group thank you publicly for the work that they do. They take it very seriously. They know that it is uh, on the backs of them to help provide you with opportunities to help increase the pathway into the classroom for qualified candidates. So I just would want to thank them for their work on that. And we're also talking about how we uh, recycle some of those people through. Our higher ed partners and representation on that committee are retiring. So we've talked about ways that we replace those folks as well. Uh, the other thing that, that we're really... Um well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Ben first, and then I'll come back. So, Ben, you've got a question or comment, please. Uh, it's a request from things that I've heard from constituents, and since mm -hmm. we're talking teacher vacancy and supply, and it's and it's it's dealing with the science licensure, mm -hmm. and I see it on there, but in case, you know, the five people are actually watching us today on YouTube, um, uh, uh, about, <laughs> yeah, millions. Um that we look at that science licensure. I've heard it from administrators that they spend a lot of money, they get a biology teacher, they spend a lot of money getting that teacher certified in chemistry and physical science and that teacher, I mean, they pour thousands of dollars into getting them licensed and then that teacher leaves for another district. Right. right. And then they have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an issue for my mid-sized schools. It's not just my small rural ones, it's it's my middle-sized schools, it's Lyons, 
uh, it's my it's my middle side schools and so it's something that as a request from administrators and, and school board members there that 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 committee looks at that and uh, and sees what we can do to cut the costs of that and, and also put qualified people in the classroom that's also very important it's keeping the quality there but uh, getting rid of some of the red tape and I, it's it's been a re common request I've gotten yeah, it's, um, you know, the science piece is, it's the rural schools, it's the mid-sized schools, it's the large schools, it's it's all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have heard from really everybody about that. So, yeah, I agree with you. Randy? One <coughs> may, thing maybe to look at, Ben, is how the math plays out over the next year or two, mm -hmm. because it's not exactly a perfect match, but math being segmented into a kind of lower end, upper end, somewhat similar if you separate science and if, and if you saw I think there's some early indication that's been good if you saw that that was really good it may or or not good however it looks it may give you some data as to how teacher vacancy and supply wants to take a look at science because it would be a similar I think effect one way or the other well, if, except if, now you're going to have to explain which is lower end biology or physics <laughs> well, the, the difference in math is, is a kind of a continuum. The difference in science is simply content, content specific. Mm -hmm. content area. So, it's, so that's why I say it's not a perfect one-to-one -one match on that end. But So we'll go to those science folks and ask. We'll go to our science teachers, people in the field, and ask them what they feel would be an appropriate way to break that license into, into two parts, as, as we did with the math. And, and on our committee, we have a high school science teacher, chemistry and physics, I think. Yes, I yes. think. And uh, so she's uh, she's been very good, and actually she really understands. She specifically said she understands the problem much better than she did. So uh, we have we specifically do have a high school. Like I said, I can't remember if she's chemistry or physics. She might be both. Higher level. Yeah. So uh, we do we do have her on the on our committee specifically so we can look at this in a very critical manner. So, Steve Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, when I'm teaching physical science and we're talking about uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius conversions, we talk about how the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit until we get to about fifth grade. And then it's 212 degrees Fahrenheit at one atmosphere of pressure. Right, so that's kind of how we do that. Uh, having been licensed for 10 years and chosen not to have a sixth initial license, um, I'll just play by the rules, whatever rules my fellow board members come up with. Um, I'm gonna do things lawfully and play by the rules. I just wanna say that after all my teaching experience, I'm very dismayed that I'm considered unqualified for a full license. I'm just very dismayed with <laughs> the whole process and so I'm I'm done I'm done begging and I'll just go with the flow thank you very much you know I, I think um, it's important for folks to understand whether they're listening or uh, via our YouTube or whatever channel we're on <laughs> who was it that said that <laughs> millions millions mr. Porter said you know uh, in the state of Kansas and you know for years I've I can't tell you. Well, I could tell you the last when I started teaching. <laughs> it's been a few years ago. Uh, but everybody, regardless of the type of license, starts with an initial license. Correct. If it's restricted or whatever it is, everybody starts with an initial license. And this is for our listening public because I know we've talked about this here. And then upon the issuance of the third contract, that person then is eligible for a professional license. Now, if I've said that wrong, would you please correct me? The only clarification is at the administrative level. If I'm adding a principal license or a superintendent license, the endorsement for those, it's one year in, in the practice of that position, and then you're issued, issued your full license. Okay. So um, there is, um, you know, we all start with a initial license, and then we uh, it's kind of on the job training, so to speak, really is what it is. And, you know, we, we provide those first two years of mentor, and that's because they need a mentor and they need that support to get to the point of uh, hopefully going to that third contract and then into that professional license. So uh, there are lots of different licenses, and we have now, correct me if again if I'm wrong, but 19 different ways to 
pathways for a license. Is that about right? That's about right. Yeah. And there are some variations in, in our pilot programs and in the restricted teaching license mm -hmm. because of the high level of mentoring and the job employment piece that those are embedded with. Mm -hmm. But for traditional candidates coming through a traditional program, they are all issued an initial license, yes, for two years. So we really welcome the board's input. I mean, what you've heard today, if you've got some other suggestions, I appreciate the suggestion that we go back and look at the uh, recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Task Force and look again at what the local schools can be doing and look at some of the other recommendations. And then we can, you know, and I like the idea of uh, asking KASB, and I'm, I see Mark back there, uh, to help us as far as seeing what the local schools can do as far as assisting in uh, some of those recommendations. And we really uh, do, Gene and I are your representatives on that, so please give us uh, feedback and suggestions. Michelle would welcome those also. Uh, Dina, question, comment? Just <clears throat> more of a cl clarification question. So you need two or three years of contracts so to move off of the initial, con the initial um, license. And employment in that position. So you would have three, three years, essentially, that you have taught and then you qualify for the professional license. Two, two. So a, two. a traditional candidate like my daughter okay, who graduated so two years. in your third, your with your third contract, you, right. you would be eligible to uh, receive a professional license. Yeah, as the system and district verify you've been through that two-year mentoring program, then that triggers the issuance of the professional license. Okay. So there's a mentoring program that Correct. you're connected with as well. Correct. Okay. Dina, Randy's going to clarify. Thanks. Well, I, I think, Dina, for me, and maybe it helps and maybe it doesn't, our agency says uh, you, are, you have the credentials to be a teacher. We need now some validation that you can teach, and that's, two years on the, that some school district saying, but we'd say you have the credentials to go teach mm -hmm. now. That's, that to me is how I think about it. That's the difference between initial and professional. <laughs> right, from the employing district, yes. Is it two years in the same district? No, or no. It can it be, be in different Correct, districts? correct. Okay. Uh, Jim McNeese, and then we'll go with Ann and Jim Porter. <clears throat> I know we get a, a yearly report on vacancies. When do we get that? In October. In October. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, it's after it starts. <laughs> Guess we know the vacancies. Um, uh, in the uh, universities, mm -hmm. uh, both public and private, uh, there are teacher candidates who are in line. H has that number, a few years ago, the number had dipped. Has that number uh, increased at all? Uh, do we see more candidates, or is it holding steady at the low end? So in my conversations with the deans who I have contact with or representation of some of those smaller groups, what I hear is that it's leveling back out again, that this, this graduating class was the smallest one, and they're starting to see an increase of those numbers. So I don't think it's by the near enough that we need to fill all of the vacancies, but it is it is leveling out and starting to increase somewhat in those Are lower freshman, sophomore classes. Are we doing anything about asking those folks that are leaving the university, why they stayed or why they got in, or have we, have we done something? You know, I, I know that there's, there's several groups. There's the ones that are traditional students and then there's non-traditional students in terms of going back and getting degrees and whatever. But, um, and then the, the, the third part has to do with the career pathways. We have supported career pathways mm -hmm. uh, for teacher education. Um, do we have numbers on that, and are they giving us any information about the students who are uh, demonstrating an interest by participation, or some of them are clubs, they're not in the pathways, they're in clubs or, or organizations that support them in that? 
you know, you. Th um, these are conversations we continue to have with teacher vacancy. Okay. And the, the question Kathy asked about how can we increase that conversation is, is a good one. And, and that career pathways is on our list to address. Yeah. And we did talk about that recently a little bit and what we're seeing is uh, <clears throat> interestingly some of the areas are beginning to create some partnerships with local community colleges or four-year universities uh, with that teacher pathway and giving more concurrent credit than they used to and then those kids are set up to go to maybe a community college, and then maybe a four-year college. So we're seeing some kind of unique pathways set up with higher ed. So, uh, you know, I think what we're beginning to see are colleges and universities are getting more creative. And uh, they're, what you're seeing is some of our folk, more folks are in alternative programs probably, not more than the traditional, but more than there used to be. I think we're seeing increasing numbers, wouldn't you say, Evidenced Michelle? Evidenced in the transition program, the restricted yeah. program, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, so you you can do those two years of teaching at different schools? It doesn't have to be two years in the same school? Correct. You just have to have verification from that employing district, whether uh -huh. it was... USD 443 and USD 201, in, in those two years, they both verify that you were part of an approved mentor program. Okay, thank you. Okay. Jim Porter? You may not be the person you know, that, I believe that two of the critical reasons that we have shortages in teachers is pay and respect. Uh, we have more money available school districts are going to have more money available this year than they have for a while at some point we need to know how they use that money and whether or not they did in fact raise the bar and i would like to have a report on that at some point because i think that that is critical to this issue another issue and I, we don't have time to discuss it today but we really need i think to encourage things like educators rising and there is apparently a barrier to them being certified, and I'd like for us to have some kind of conversation at some point to see how we can expedite that process. Thank you. You know, interestingly enough, Jim, uh, Randy, and I, that's where we're headed at 1245 is to meet with a group at KASB and the superintendent's group, and uh, we're going to have some conversation about, you know, how are folks going to spend their money and get some information out there. Very so, good. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Janet Waugh. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> As a senior member, I'd like to tell you that when I came on the board and for years before that, we had an overabundance of teachers. My own daughter had to go to Houston to teach for three years before she could come back to Kansas to get a job. And she wanted to teach in Kansas. She's my homebody, you know. And so it's changed unbelievably, and I believe the, I agree with Jim, it's money and respect has had a lot to do with that. But also, when I first got on this board 20 years ago, one of our first, the first challenges I remember discussing was barriers to licensure. And I would like to commend the uh, licensure department. We have done a wonderful, an amazing job because to me, we walk a very thin wire when we walk this thing is we've got to maintain high quality and yet, you know, fill these classrooms with teachers. So anyway, I just wanted to, for those of you who aren't aware of the background, we at one time had a lot of teachers <laughs> and teachers aren't enrolled going to school anymore. And I do think that what Jim said just kind of sums it up. And, and I also want to make sure that these teachers, it's kind of, it hurts me really bad when I hear Oklahoma's paying more than we're paying. I think that's not nice. <laughs> so anyway, I just want to give my kudos to the licensure department and the department for working so diligently on getting these things corrected. And I think the board has worked hard on this also. So thank you. Thank you. Well, and to follow that up, I'd say our work is not done. No, no. Uh, but we are working and will continue to bring things back to the board. And I would encourage you to continue to let Jean, myself, and Michelle give us any feedback because we're very receptive and we got a pretty hard group working group and uh, they're pretty diligent. So Randy, did you have anything you'd like to close with? Um, thank you. I, I want to also, you don't need reminded, but, but I will. We have a leadership shortage also. 
uh, the principal ranks, superintendent ranks. Uh, uh, high school principal is a really difficult job. It's, it's long hours and multiple hats you're wearing. Uh, and uh, superintendency is a complex job also. And we're seeing um, an ascendancy from the teacher to that level so fast that um, they just don't have enough work experience. So we've got shortages all across the spectrum as we think about this issue. I totally agree, and you, you know, I said this, Michelle said I was on a soapbox, I think, in Manhattan. Uh, it is about respect, and it, that starts with us. I, I tell my daughter all the time, social media is not your private diary. You know, uh, it's not, uh, and and we just need to be careful how we talk about the profession first, among our, the profession ourselves. And second, Jim, you're exactly right. We have an obligation to pay people more, and we have an op we have an opportunity that the governor and the legislature together have given us, and it's our obligation to to make that promise to the people that serve with kids. And so, um, um, you know, with that, I just appreciate the work. It's far from finished. We have a lot of work to do. And so I've said, you know, at, at that time in Manhattan, to me it's not about adding the, the 20th way to get a license. It's about taking care of how do we get more in the 19 ways that we have it to go on and how do we, how do we push that forward as hard as we can. So uh, appreciate the efforts by everyone. Thank you. Janet? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Randy brought up a thought of mine, you know, uh, the loss of administrators. You know, I, we kind of used to have kind of people just growing into superintendent, and now we're putting teachers as superintendent. Uh, I remember during all these cuts during this budget, I had, I can't tell you how many superintendents tell me, I'm retiring, I can't handle this anymore. They're tired of the cuts. I mean, they're in, they, it just broke, I think it kind of broke them because they, couldn't handle doing this to the kids. And this is what they were doing. They were basically removing programs and doing it to the teachers, doing it to everyone. I think they, their heart wasn't in it. So number one, I think, would be money. And hopefully this is going to help. But if there are other issues like respect and other issues, I think maybe we look, need to look at those. What are the issues besides money? We know money's the number one issue. But, and then maybe there's some way we can work to restore some of these things. Maybe we need to have more recognition programs or whatever we can do to help not only our teachers, but well, our entire staffs. You know, I mean, because this goes back all the way to, you know, even our, our uh, bus drivers, our custodians, our secretaries, paras, all those. So anyway, I think those are issues we need to look at, you know, because thankfully the legislature is recognizing, or the court maybe <laughs> is recognizing that we need more money. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may, recently when I have the opportunity to talk with my national and international partners who do this work, this is an issue for all of them and it does always boil down to those two things, the idea of respect and the idea of pay, always. So it's not just our Kansas issue, it's a larger issue and I appreciate your support as we continue to explore op options for our state. Thank you, Michelle, appreciate it. Well, on what Janet said, I mean, we have a conference every year on retention, mm -hmm. okay? And two years ago, there was a guy there from a university in Pennsylvania who listed out, like, the top ten reasons teachers either stay or don't stay. And he laid it all out for us. It was um, some money, but the top things were mentoring and uh, professional development and making sure teachers are qualified before they get in the classroom and um, giving teachers more voice in particularly in um, discipline and, and, you know, listening to them. I mean, so we have this conference. This guy comes to town. He tells us exactly what we need to do. Are we doing anything with it? I mean, we know. So I don't know. We need, we've got the information. We need to do something with it. Yeah, well, and a number of us went to that, went to those. And they'll have the conference again this year, I believe. So I'm sure a number of us will go again. Correct. And trying to grow the audience because the <coughs> folks who are at that are on our, it's preaching to the choir. So we're trying to grow the audience of folks who attend, the people who hire, the larger organizations, the, the other opportunities to increase the conversation. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to move into uh, reports and a request for future agenda items. So we'll start uh, legislative liaisons. That's Jim Porter and Dina. I don't know if you guys, we've kind of talked about some things. but We have not yet, uh, and I'll defer to Dina, but I think as we meet to talk about legislative issues, for those things that you are concerned about, would you just let us know, and we can uh, incorporate that, and then we'll probably have a pretty lengthy list, and then the board will have to decide what what areas are our priorities, uh, but now defer the rest of that to Dina. So what, what you'll kind of look at, Jim, is bringing back to us, um, let's say, a, almost a platform of legislative agenda items for the board to have a conversation about. Right. And okay. then like I would request sometime in the summer or early fall a workshop to where right. we actually can have in-depth discussion. And, and so whenever Dina and I have to go to the legislature, uh, pardon me, whenever Dean and I get to go to the legislature, uh, we would have a, uh, we would not be speaking for ourselves, but we would in fact be officially speaking for the board. So, so uh, board members, as you think of items that you would like to potentially be placed on the legislative agenda, let Dina and Jim know, and then they'll bring us, bring that back to us and we'll do it in some kind of a open discussion kind of a yeah, format. And, and Jen, and I defer to my, my my senior member to my yeah. right. I don't, I don't, re I know since I, since I've been here, we've not had a really a legislative agenda. Have you ever? Never. But I the think, budget. but I think if we are going to be representing the children of this state, we need to have a consistent message and we need to agree on it before I go over there. Cause I'll, I can go over and talk out of my head, but I think I'd much rather speak for the, you know, officially speak for the board. Uh, and that I would ditto everything that Jim just said and specifically underline the fact that um, I often get asked what our position, what the board's position is, and typically we really don't, we haven't officially taken a position, and um, we're going to try to be perspective and look ahead instead of having the opportunity to have someone ask us, by that time we will know what your position is, and um, yeah. so... While there'll still be some that probably we won't have that knowledge because there's always something new that pops up, but um, we will have a better idea of what your ideas are. And so that's very important, I think, that we appear to be all working together with even other groups that support education as well so we're and a block instead of what they can separate and attack and yeah, we think individual ways so we, we think we can be a more effective proactive as opposed to right. reactive yep. very good okay dina anything on policy um not at this point okay but um, things we may take Grow up. a couple things that have been talked about and uh, if they need to be in policy, we will, we will deal with those. Okay, very good. Thank you. Communication committee, Jim and Ben? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the Western Kansas trip is still on the agenda, and if you might look at the last week of September is what we're looking at on your calendars. Uh, it will be two days. Uh, we're talking with districts in, in the western part to put the agenda together, similar to what we've done in other areas. Uh, we'll have more on that hopefully in July and be able to nail down the exact dates and what we're doing. Okay. Um, we have the 50th celebration of our uh, esteemed board. Uh, come, that's this year. So in October, at our October 13th meeting, we're hoping we can have a reception, just a little, maybe from 3.30 to 5, um, invite some guests to celebrate with us, a little 
cake and punch and, um, and, and basically promote uh, and, and, and make people more aware of uh, our board's history, um, la, a, a mission and, and legal focus, as well as uh, just celebrate who we are and what we've done. You know, now we are going to uh, probably ask you, just getting there, God, you are just a, you are just eager. Um, we, and, and I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but we will probably be looking at uh, communicating in some way with uh, uh, past board members to see if they would like to come back. And uh, Janet, since you know most of them, Oh, I thought you were proud of that. <laughs> what, but <clears throat> it, it, it's hard to ask someone, especially those who are in a long distance, to come for an hour and a half, though some may want to. But it's nice to be remembered as well. But we may be counting on you to help us uh, find some of these members. I mean, it's not like they just went back and stayed in there waiting for us to invite them. So uh, those of recent past, we, all, we, we, we know, but you know, going back uh, the 50 years, um, we're going to have to have your help and rely on you to help get communi to communicate with them. You know, so we might be asking you uh, to do a little digging your own. Um, you know, I won't touch that one any further. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and in, in it's, it's really, we have um, a very nice, some very nice materials that we'll be providing, and we'll have a video to go with it, and uh, uh, it'll be uh, nice, but it'll be probably small. You know, um, if there's someone you'd, you'd like to invite, uh, we'll be asking you for that information shortly as well, besides that. We'll be, at, we'll be inviting the, the usual groups and organizations that are partnered with us to make sure that they're included. We'll invite the governor and legislators and so on. But, you know, it is going to be, it, it's tough to come for an hour and a half celebration, especially if you're out in western Kansas or you have to make a living. You know, so, uh, yeah, we've got that coming along. Uh, the communications uh, committee of Ben and I would be very um, supportive, eager, and in fact, um, hey, this would be great if we did have a legislative uh, platform, you know, that we could uh, all work from, not just with legislators, but back at, with local boards and with local groups in our uh, d districts. That would be very helpful. You know, so uh, we would certainly want to want that and be happy to help and, and support that. Uh, I just want to bring up one thing about um, uh, October as well. NASB's uh, national conference is going to be in Omaha on September 17th, 18th, and 19th. October. Did I, what did I say? Oh, no, October. I'm sorry. God, October 17th, 18th, and 19th. And I want to, you know, encourage you to be part of that and uh, be talking to folks about maybe carpooling, you know, from here to Omaha after our meeting because we are meeting <clears throat> those days right before it. Very good. Anything Thank else? Ben? Um, I just want to stretch that even though the legislature's not in session, they're now in your districts. Uh, and this is a good time to touch base with them when they're actually at home <coughs> versus being up here in Topeka. Um, so anytime I'm out working in a legislator's district visiting a school, I always send them a heads up about uh, coming and seeing what's happening in their district. If it's a visit of that nature, sometimes you're there for not so much a school visit, but a sit down with a superintendent that probably good that there's not too many people in the room, but um, but if you're visiting a school, I would encourage you to, to reach out to your legislators, especially with this early education uh, tour going throughout the state. Uh, I had one in Emporia on Monday, I have one in Newton next week, and one in Hutchinson in my district. And so I've been reaching out to legislators there to, to participate in that conversation as well. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, Jim Porter, the School Bus Stop Arm Committee. I think you have some information for yeah, us. Yeah, I'm going to do three things. First of all, the GAC, the Government Affairs Committee, met yesterday. Uh, we had a report that actually the federal al allocations are are going to be similar to the past without any cuts. And uh, I'll be getting a review in the next two or three days of that meeting, and I'll send it to Peggy so that everybody can can see the information from that. Uh, 
as part of the GAC, I was visiting uh, the the two the, the first two people were that were on the conference before everybody else got there was me and the uh, representative Jane from Colorado. She had uh, asked me to give information about the dyslexia task force to her a few months ago, and they have actually. Uh, Colorado has actually used that as a, as a uh, model and have uh, actually uh, uh, approved some some dyslexia legislation based on our task force recommendations. The school stop arm committee met uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, you know th there are significant over a thousand passings of a school bus in a, every day or every day that the, every day it's been given, some of those are on the right. Uh, Janet, I was able, not uh, unable to go to the first meeting, and uh, Janet went for me and indicated that there was some reluctance on the part of the uh, law enforcement to do that. that. That had dissipated by this point, and this was a very positive meeting with people recognizing there is a problem, recognizing there needs to do something about it. There's a small subcommittee that is made up of uh, law enforcement and uh, lobbyists for uh, that uh, that appears that is going to put together recommendations uh, uh, for legislation, and the and the chairman of the uh, of the House Transportation Committee was also a participant, along with Jim Carlskent, and so I consider that very positive. I believe that we'll have a recommendation that, I, and I'm going to I'm, we're at least going to discuss that on our legislative agenda because it, in all likelihood, is going to be something that we need to. Uh, proactively support. I'll keep you, as, as we get more information, I'll present that, but 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 it appears that meeting was extremely positive uh, about we have to do something and we have to do something But before we're saying, well, we, uh, to that bereaved parent, uh, well, you know, we were too busy. You know, that doesn't go very well. So we need to make sure that we have some sort of activity so that we can, and the issue is not punishment, the issue is changing behavior. We want people to stop and make sure that people are safe. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, confidence in Kansas public education, Janet. I think you had a meeting recently. Thing you want to re report? I had it on, I had it on my written report. Well, I, you want me to report anything? Yeah, I wanted to report. And, you know, one of the things we might want to think about is, <clears throat> I mean, right now we've been doing the challenge committees and I think our challenge awards. And I think for some of you with larger districts, that's been a challenge. Uh, so, uh, some of the smaller districts, like myself, geographically anyway, it's not so bad. No, yeah, uh, we, we, did, we did meet, and we did discuss the challenge awards, uh, and uh, we discussed that, uh, you know, we were very, we liked the way, how, how are the board's <laughs> doing it is great. You know, I told them that the board <laughs> appears to be, they, they enjoy this also, but I also told them the challenges. And they said, well, they believe that it ought to be simply left up to every board member. That's what they thought was going on anyway. So if, like, for instance, if you want to have a regional dinner or something, that, that's up to you. You know, you, you, your choice, you know. They probably don't have the funding to help fund it, but, you know, maybe we could figure out a way or something like that. So the Challenge Awards, if that's all right, unless those you want me to bring take something back to them, they were very comfortable in that, you know, and continuing on and having board members determine the venues. Because I've heard of every venue possible. Wasn't there an art fair somebody, I think, went to to <laughs> make a presentation or something, you know? You went to the art fair? Yeah, I don't have a problem with the venue. I have a problem with what they're measuring. I mean, yeah, with I our direction that. moving away from one test on one day, and in the past, that whole challenge award was how much did you improve in test scores? This year they added attendance to it, but I don't know what the proportion was, but I got a complaint from an elementary um, dist uh, elementary school in the district that scored really high on improvement, but they missed on attendance, and so they didn't get one. Anyway, we need to look at what they're measuring. I, we discussed this also, and I talked with Denise about when she was here, you know, so maybe she could discuss this, but they did include these things, and they're going to include more. She told me about how one district specifically, I can't read, she didn't tell me, give me a name had it scored extremely high, but they had scored very low on the, extremely low on the others. And I don't know what the others, what if that included attendance or whatever, but it was just, uh, but anyway, I think maybe maybe we could ask her at the next meeting possibly to give this a rationale uh, for, because uh, I, I discussed this specifically with her, you know, 
I didn't ask, like I say, for the district, so I couldn't tell you which one it was. But uh, but if there's any other challenges, maybe maybe we could just ask her for a report during our next meeting. I'm sure she could do it in about 10 minutes. And then also we discussed the governor's uh, awards, the governor's scholars, and uh, we discussed, and, and frankly, they brought up the fact <laughs> that uh, I didn't even have to bring it up about everyone leaving. <laughs> this was brought up because we have new people there and they felt it was totally inappropriate so they're going to try to they're going to change that you know that will be changed and also uh they're going to try to get parents on both sides you know rather than all on the one side this way because they still want to continue with the dinner but they want to have parents because you know this way everyone can kind of see so those are the changes that they're uh we discussed possibly making at our next uh governor scholars thank you thank you janet uh, bullying task force, they had their, was it the first session in Clearwater? Um, I was there and Jim McNeese was there and the next one's coming up in Garden City. Uh, Randy, do you want to share anything on that since? Sure. Uh, they had an organizational meeting here in Topeka and then the first actual meeting in Clearwater followed up by Garden City. Uh, you can see on our website, then there's subsequent meetings throughout the state. 37 member task force, it's very inclusive. Uh, I know they're looking at also how to continue to get feedback from people that cannot attend. Uh, it's hard when you have a 37 member task force, you're traveling throughout the state and there's no budget for this. Uh, so we wanna, again, thank those that are volunteering their time because there's lots of people doing that. Important topic and they will have a recommend, recommendations back to you before, the, before this calendar year is out. Thank you, Randy. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Individual written reports are in your meeting folders, so please take a look at those. Uh, board attorney report. Mark doesn't have anything today. Request for future agenda items. Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to pass these out as a reminder of what I thought my agenda should be expressed as back in March of 2017, and I want to do a shout out to Idalia because one of my talking points addresses unions. I think you know, you've, you've been to enough meetings to know, I sat down in March of 17. If I were running the show, this is what I would emphasize. If I were going to change schools to work for every child, this is what I would emphasize. We've already started on, on the moonshot Kansas leads the world in the success of each student. And one of the talking points was encourage unions to morph into professional associations. I tried to be diplomatic. I'm not anti-union. I actually think unions are great for building trades, but I actually say that teaching is not union work. And I hold to that. And I hope that statements like that don't just generate animus, that we can talk about issues and what's good for kids. Because you know, I could say truthfully that I love you because I know you're working for cans and families. But I hope you know that I am too. So my request for future agenda items is please review this list. It was written with uh, love. And I know you, you can't get everything you ask for in this life. And some of these issues are federal. Uh, stop labeling kids by race, get rid of free and reduced lunch program, replace it with lunch. Those are federal issues. But uh, there's, a, there's a lot to digest here. And I, I think that if we consider these elements with the spirit intended, maybe we can come closer to landing on the moon a little quicker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Other requests? Okay, um, Chairman's report, just real quickly, I really don't have too much. School Mental Health Advisory Council, we will be meeting in July. We meet at the same time that SEAC, and I think there's another group that meets at uh, their summer leadership concert conference in Wichita. So we'll be meeting there. <clears throat> so for uh, August, I should have a little feedback um, for you there. Early childhood community conversations, Ben mentioned those. There is a schedule in your folder for the remaining meetings. So if 
if you can try to get to one of those that is there. Uh, just a reminder, our next meeting is July 9th and 10th. And we'll certainly, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be voting on budget recommendations. So, you know, you might want to restudy that PowerPoint and think about that. There may be a little bit of information uh, <clears throat> coming from uh, some other groups, the dyslexia and such, for possible inclusion in a budget recommendation. Uh, we will have the receipt of the driver's education standards uh, in July. And then we're going to have information on the redesign schools that will be launching in 19 and 20. Uh, many Gemini 1 and Gemini 2 schools. And Randy, we're going to have a little different format this time. Do you want to share that with us? Format will be uh, Jay and Tammy will go over all those with you. We have a large number. And uh, the, you'll get a summary report of what they're going to do in their launch. But they will not all give a presentation like we did uh, in Mercury and, and the Gemini ones that launched initially. It's kind of nice that we have so many that we have to kind of change the format. That the, but uh, that's kind of neat, really. So we've got to have, we'll have a lot of launches coming. And you'll, you'll certainly know who all those schools are and those in your district. You'll be able to pop in maybe around the start of the school year and kind of see what's going on there. Okay, um, we will talk about board travel. Any additions to travel or changes to travel? I have to see what mine was. Okay, <laughs> I had to see what I had on the list. Uh, Jean? Yes, I just wanted to see if I could add a June 17th um, trip to the Southwest Plains Regional Service Center for a formative assessment workshop that I was invited to by Dr. Gillespie. Okay, very good. Ann, did you have something? No? no that's okay. Others, anything else on travel? Okay, I take a motion to approve the travel from Jim McNeese, a second. Janet Waugh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Looks to me like a nine zero. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. Madam Chair, is the budget next year, do we think, going to be about the same for travel after July 1? Do we know yet? I be don't anticipate we've got any changes in the amount of money because I don't think there is any more money. Would that be right, Randy? <laughs> um, that is correct. One, uh, while schools are getting uh, quite a bit more money. The agency to run is not getting <laughs> any additional money. So oh, that's okay. uh, that, would, that would be true. State board would have the same budget. Because it looks like we came out a little bit underwater this year. Not bad, but I mean. Ooh, so we're going to be more underwater. Yeah, so we I'd just need to really watch it. I mean, I know Jim and Jim probably get a lot of requests because they're past presidents to do more things than the rest of us, but. Oh, you mean for our meetings and all that stuff. Yeah, no, I was just looking at this when we're underwater here, so. Okay, thank you. I think that's a good reminder, though. Uh, we, the, the department's on a tight budget, and as a result, we're kind of on a tight budget. I mean, we certainly want people to get out to their districts and, you know, visit, visit the schools, and we have a, you know, we're on more task force than we've ever been on. I'm getting ready to ask some people to be on the vaping task force. So, you know, we're doing more things, but uh, we do have to be kind of conscious of the, you know, the budget is the budget, and we all know how that works. So we need to be cognizant of that. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay, well, I would, uh, I know several people have some meetings to go to, so wish you good luck with those meetings and uh, continue to have a, a good summer because that is upon us. So thank you very much, and the meeting is adjourned.